In a huge library, the main character was choosing a book she wanted to read. The girl thought it was amazing that she could find out what people were thinking a few hundred years ago. The girl's name is Susie, she is 19 years old, and she is a simple college student. In a group chat of friends, her girlfriend suggested that the main character meet up today and go to the mall. Susie replied that she couldn't because she hadn't finished her essay yet, she would have to be alone in the library. Her friends called her a crammer and were angry that she didn't want to go with them. The girl really liked to read books and the most different works. Books seemed to take her to another world. Susie was angry with herself that she started reading a random book again, instead of searching for materials for the essay. It was late, but it was time to get to work instead of reading whatever came to hand. Susie came across a book with a history of the Flower Kingdom. The book said it was the continent of stars and moon, the story of the Flower Kingdom. It was a mysterious mystical novel, a centuries-old history of an ancient state. Ji Nuo is one of the greatest kings of the Flower Kingdom. He suppressed the rebellion caused by the figures of the past monarch overnight. In his rage, he extinguished the flames of war and brought the kingdom to a glory comparable to the Boer Empire. The king had the greatest support in the people and at the same time a harsh dictator. Ji Nuo nicknamed Reinhardt, the 14th monk of the Flower Kingdom with many distinguished honors, known for his hatred of women. During his reign, no woman held a civilian or military position. The women's academies established by the rulers of past centuries have faded into oblivion. This iron monarch, for various reasons, banished all women from the government, sending them to the provinces, leaving only the possibility of being the guardians of the home. The ruler did not spare even his own children, always favoring boys. He wished with all his heart to pass the throne exclusively to his son, but the main concubine was all barren, and the palace harem gave birth to six girls in a row. By the time the queen gave birth, the abbot predicted that the flower kingdom would be granted an heir, who would lead the country to even greater glory. The entire kingdom froze in anticipation. Susie stumbled on the stairs and fell down with the book, and found herself in the continent of Sinews, the official residence of the king. The girl didn't understand why the imaginary picture in her head seemed so real. Looking at the king, it seemed to Susie that he was very handsome. A maid came to the ruler and informed him that the queen had given birth. Susie wondered why she could hear everything they said. It was unclear to the girl how it happened, and she seemed to have been transported through time and ended up in this kingdom. In Yao's Moon Palace, the queen was lying on a bed after giving birth. Events were beginning to take a bad turn. The ruler entered to look at his child. The queen said she had given the baby the name Susie Yu. The main character turned into this infant. They even had the same names and it was a mismatch. The ruler couldn't wait to find out the sex of the baby. There was a crowd of people in Wangguan Square, and everyone was discussing the queen's birth and the sex of the baby. They were discussing that if a princess was born and inherited the beauty of the king, she would surely be the most beautiful princess in the entire continent. It was also rumored that the king had no love for princesses. The people knew that the ruler already had six daughters, and the worst thing was if he had a daughter again. It was rumored that all the concubines who had given birth before had been kicked out. The king went out into the square to the people and told them to rejoice because the heir was born. People shouted with joy and congratulated the queen. Naturally, the protagonist did not become a boy. This little gentleman being honored by the crowd is not Susie at all, although everyone calls him the queen's child. But it wasn't like that at all. In fact, the queen's child was Susie. The ruler announced to everyone that a son had been born to him and named the boy Jauban. The woman looked sadly at her poor daughter Susie. It turned out that the protagonist had traveled to the world of that book to the Xingyue continent, to the Flower Kingdom. Ji Nuo was disappointed to discover that the seventh child was a girl. He did not want to accept the fact that the girl would become the next monarch and, without a moment's hesitation, introduced Zhao to the world, calling him the son of the queen. In fact, it was the son of his younger brother. According to history, this king is an unimaginable bastard, and for the sake of his desire to have an heir son, he named his younger brother's child, passing him off as the queen's son. In order to keep it a secret, Zhao's real mother was disposed of by executing her. 
Everyone who knows the truth is strictly forbidden to divulge it. And now, the protagonist personally goes through all these events. Little Susie was lying in her crib. She thought it was a bad dream or a nightmare. She hoped that now someone would pinch her and everything would be over. In her past life, the protagonist's parents died early, and she wanted a complete family more than anything. Maybe her wish to have both parents was fulfilled in this life, or maybe she demanded too much. The maids held Susie in their arms and announced to the king that a girl had been born again. The protagonist realized that she was truly in this place and there was no turning back. Ji Nuo held his daughter in his arms and called her the seventh girl. The ruler thought that there was no use for her and they were all the same, ignorant and fragile. Of course, the protagonist did not want a scoundrel father. Listening to all this, little Susie cried that the ruler himself when he was born also looked frail and ignorant. The king ordered the maid to bring Zhao to him. When the king's younger brother's son was brought, he told the queen that according to the abbot's prediction, the child she would give birth to would be the heir to the throne. Ji Nuo told the queen that this child would bring his country great glory. The king told the woman to remember once and for all that this boy was her son and his heir. The queen could not disobey. Little Susie was ordered by the king to be sent to the Tower of the Celestials, a place for sacrifice to the gods. Those who enter the tower will only die, but it is said that their souls may be chosen to serve in the heavenly office. Listening and understanding everything the king said, Susie thought he was a monster. The queen begged the ruler to spare the little girl, and though she disappointed the king, this was her native daughter, her blood and flesh, the woman cried and said that she would send her away from the palace and not a soul would know of her origins. The king only kept silent in response. It was obvious that the ruler would not let anyone know that his seventh child was a girl. Zhao's mother was executed to keep this secret, and anyone who knows the true state of affairs is forbidden to speak of it on pain of death. The queen realized that now her daughter would suffer the same fate. The ruler replied to the queen, that she had better make sure that he never saw little Susie. Outside the palace, the queen gave up her daughter. She cried and hoped the little girl could take care of herself. Just like that, barely born, the little girl was sent into exile forever, and her birth father wanted to kill her just because she was a girl. In fact, he turned out to be quite a bastard. Susie was taken to a small town on the outskirts of the capital. In the house, the maids discussed that the baron had returned with a child in his arms. He had three sons of his own, and he had made a child on the side. No one expected the Baron to be such a man. The maid said that all men were the same, and it was a great disgrace to the vile family. It was incomprehensible on which poor girl such a misfortune had fallen. The Baron always seemed loving and gentle, and in fact turned out to be just like everyone else. The servants thought that Lady Catherine, the Baron's wife, was heartbroken. Catherine, having read the letter, said the man was a cruel man. Into the woman's chamber burst her 12-year-old son Arnold. He was the Baron's second son. The boy asked his mother if what the servants were saying was true. Catherine answered her son that he was no longer a little boy, but was behaving indecently. Next to her stood Baron Morel's eldest son. He was 15 years old, a calm and reserved boy. Morel apologized for disturbing him and said he hadn't looked after the younger one and promised to take him away now. Also, the Baron with Karen had a son named Avery. He is four years old and a little mischievous boy. The Baron's name was Stefan Weil. He was 50 years old. He told his children that nothing was wrong and told them to come closer because this case was about them too. The Baron announced to his children that starting today, this little girl would be their sister, Susie Weil. Stefan had said that they should all get along well with each other. Arnold, the middle son, was outraged and said that they brought a bastard girl into the house and still demanded respect for her. Mural took his brother in his arms. Arnold continued to call his father a bastard and accused him of dishonoring their entire family. One of the sons asked his father who was his mistress, who bore him a daughter. Catherine firmly answered her sons that the matter was closed and she had already forgiven their father. The woman declared that the resentment of her sons was not necessary here. Arnold was very indignant and told his mother that she did not deserve such treatment and the Baron could roll out of here to his wench. Catherine told her son to shut his mouth and said once again 
that the matter was closed, and from now on, Susie was family. And that was the end of it. Arnold said he wasn't going to get involved with the bastard because she had rotten blood running through her. He turned around and left. Catherine asked Morel to keep an eye on her brother and make sure he didn't do anything stupid. Susie saw the cold look in her eldest son's eyes and realized that they wouldn't get along easily. Catherine told her husband that the children were in no condition to accept it. Stefan said there was nothing that could be done and they owed a lot to that man. Susie's origins had to remain a secret. Catherine wondered if they really wouldn't tell the whole truth to their sons. When the Baron returned with the little girl, there was already talk in the neighborhood. Stefan believed that the fewer people who knew the truth, the better. They decided to stick to the version on which everyone had already agreed. That's how the main character got into the vile family. Despite the fact that her brothers were not very happy about the appearance of the girl, the others were very kind to her. The maids took care of the girl and said that she was soft and smelled nice. She was a strong child and weighed four kilograms and 400 grams. When the Baron's youngest son was born, he weighed only three kilograms. No adult remembered himself as an infant. The protagonist wondered if her parents had been as happy in a previous life when they were nursing a baby girl. Susie thought that when she was naked, others could do whatever they wanted, which was too much. If the protagonist in her past life had only known that her birth brought the same happiness to those around her, even left to her own devices, she would have been much happier. Lady Catherine, with little Susie in her arms, and the servants were strolling through the garden. Young Arnold was also playing there, throwing a ball to a dog. When he saw his mother and child, he called her a little brat. The Baron's middle son had an idea. He threw the ball to the dog toward little Susie. The dog jumped at the women, and the little brat was dropped to the ground. Stefan came running to the noise. Little Susie was lying on the floor crying. She was in a lot of pain. Catherine took the girl in her arms and tried to calm her down. The maids were glad that the child's head was intact, saying that if the girl had crashed, it would have been a horror. Little Susie was called to the doctor. After examining the girl, he said that, fortunately, little Susie is fine, there are only a few bruises and need to apply more often ointment and everything will go away. Catherine was angry with Arnold and asked how he could do such a thing. The woman said that if the girl had crashed to death, there would have been trouble. She threatened that she would get rid of the dog. Catherine asked her son where his kindness and conscience had gone. She was ashamed to have such a son. Catherine announced to the boy that he would be grounded for the next three months and would have time to think hard about his behavior. The woman told him to come over and apologize to his sister. Little Avery said he was about to tell Arnold a secret and told him that this girl was a witch and you can't make her mad. Mural intervened in the conversation and asked his younger brother how he knew all this. The Baron's eldest son took the younger one by his clothes and lifted him above the floor. He reminded his brother that he knew what punishment would follow if forbidden magic was used on common people. Avery begged his older brother to spare him and told him that he had only cast the lowest level of black enchantments to grow fiery boils on her. The boy said that he had discovered that Susie was immune to black magic, and that proved that she was a witch. Mural was angry that the boy had cast a spell on the baby. Arnold walked over to Susie's crib. Everyone was too worried about her at that moment, and perhaps it was only then that she noticed the look of fear and worry on Arnold's face. He didn't want to really hurt the main character. Because of his childishness, he wanted to make a little fun of the stranger he saw in her. As he got closer to Susie, Arnold noticed that she was smiling. The boy was pleased and reached into his sister's hand. There was a contact between them. Baron, looking at everything that was happening, told Catherine that it was only an impulsive act of the child, and now they get along with each other. Stefan's wife was very worried about it. Arnold was just a naive child. Susie held her middle brother's finger and wished he was more cheerful for she was not hurt and was not angry with him at all. Arnold was delighted at how cute the baby was. Avery and Morel noticed that their brother had already fallen under the spell of little Susie. The younger one said that the girl didn't look like a breastfed infant at all. The older brother replied that he, at his age of four, didn't look much like a toddler either. Arnold often stopped by his mother's house when she was nursing or feeding Susie. Once again, when the son entered the bedroom, 
Catherine explained to him that it was time for his sister to go to bed, and he had better play outside. The son reminded his mother that he and his father had put him under house arrest for three months, so he was staying home. The boy didn't understand why Susie would go to bed so early. Arnold promised to play with the baby. The dog in the corner was waiting for a ball to be thrown to him and whined. He wanted to play. Catherine told her son that he could babysit the baby for a while and should make sure she didn't wake up and told him not to make too much noise. As she left the girl's bedroom, Catherine thought about her son Arnold becoming more mature, but didn't realize if that was a good thing. The boy couldn't resist his sister's soft cheeks and poked a finger at her. Arnold felt that the girl's cheek was very soft and said it was time to get down to business and wake up. He gently nudged his sister and said that the most favorite big brother came to play with her, told her to wake up. Opened his eyes. Susie saw Arnold. She had a dream that she was pecked by a whole flock of crows and it turned out to be her brother. The little girl got angry, started waving her arms, and her brother thought that the girl wanted to be held in his arms. In fact, Susie just wanted to be allowed to sleep. Arnold lifted the little girl in his arms and said, since her father was so concerned for her welfare, and even though she seemed aloof, inside in fact, she loved him very much because the younger brother Avery never asked for his arms. The boy marveled at how pretty she was and how nice she smelled. He realized that the girl didn't annoy him that much. Susie was worried that he might drop her. The little tomboy didn't know how to hold babies at all, and the girl was uncomfortable in his arms. Arnold thought Susie's behavior was a sign of how much she loved him. He called the little girl by name and told her that she was so perceptive and drawn to him because he was the best of the vile family. Susie felt dizzy. She was afraid her brother wouldn't drop her. Arnold said that since she loved him with all her heart, then by all means, he would recognize her as his sister. In her past life, the protagonist was an orphan, and at first she thought her rebirth in this world was a punishment from above. But now she is of a different opinion, because now she really has a family. For the past few months, Miss Catherine had been personally babysitting the protagonist. She was pleasant and warm, the Baron's wife noticed that Susie was so tired that she couldn't even finish her milk and didn't understand why this was happening. One of the servants said that she had seen young Mr. Arnold playing with baby Susie for a long time, and that must have been the reason. The protagonist thought of this kid treating her like a toy and bored her to death. Although Baron Whale didn't show much concern, at least he didn't treat her like an infant and allowed her to be present while he was busy training his sons. Stefan had said that Morel had already passed the selection process for the Imperial School. Father spoke to Arnold regarding his progress in his studies. The father decided to start today with a math test. The middle son is the only one who answered the test question incorrectly. The protagonist had an opportunity to get a better understanding of the world. The Baron told Arnold that if he continued to study poorly, he would go to a church school. This is an educational institution specializing in learning and self-improvement, a school for monks and clergymen. Arnold replied that he would qualify for the military academy, and his goal was to become a knight. The educational model of this world is similar to the European model of the early Middle Ages. The monopoly is held by the clergy, and secular education is mainly represented by the imperial school at the royal court and the military academy for aristocrats, general education had not yet been established. Stefan said that ever since King Jinuo came to the throne, there wasn't a single illiterate knight left in this kingdom. Hearing the king's name, Susie remembered what a scumbag he was and how much he pissed her off. Arnold didn't know the answer to the next question on the test either. He grabbed his head and tried to solve the example. Susie, who was already sitting in the boy's arms, pointed her finger at the correct answer. The boy, not thinking long, answered that the correct answer was the second one. The father confirmed that this was the correct answer. Arnold cheered and said he was doing a good job. The brother kissed Susie and called her his salvation. Because he had answered correctly, the main character thought that this boy was critically lacking in basic knowledge and should study more. Avery called his brother a cheater. Arnold called the younger one an evil devil in response. Avery pointed his finger at Susie and said she was a witch and told him the right answer. Arnold was furious and asked the little bugger not to talk nonsense. The father told his sons to stop fighting. 
he sent Arnold to do his homework with Morel. Avery, he said he had heard rumors that the boy had tried to put a spell on his little sister. Hearing this, Susie screamed. She resented that the boy had used magic from this world on her. She wanted to strangle him. Avery justified himself to his father and told him that he just wanted the girl to stop crying. Besides, the curse didn't work anyway. The boy speculated that it was a matter of his powers not being strong enough to harm someone yet, or Susie being an alien. These are people who were born immune to magic, mostly witches or the cursed. The main character heard all of this, but she couldn't say anything. She didn't believe this boy and was sure that he was definitely up to something bad. And nowadays everyone's teeth were being gagged. Susie didn't know if he could have guessed that she wasn't from this world. Even if he did, the protagonist was not afraid of him. The girl was sure that she could show what kind of power adults had, but for now it wasn't so important because now they had to figure out what kind of magic it was. Susie was being dragged by the hair by a dark-haired girl and threatened that she was about to call her older brother and he would deal with her. The girl called the protagonist an ugly, useless trash and said that the worthless orphan has no brothers. Behind the back of her abuser, the protagonist heard a man's voice saying that the brothers were here. One of the brothers approached Susie, gave her a hand and helped her stand up. He said that her most favorite brother had arrived. Little Susie woke up in her crib and realized that it was just a dream. Although the girl now really did have three older brothers, she still had a hard time believing it. She wondered if they would really be so cool when they grew up. Arnold had been so kind to the protagonist in her dream, and if the current one got a little wiser, he would be quite bearable. Nothing was clear with Mural yet. The devil Avery would definitely not be a good brother, because he used magic on her. Miss Catherine approached the main character, noticing that the little girl was awake. She told Susie that now they would go wash up, dress her up in a pretty dress, and go for a walk. The maids in the house were cleaning and discussing whether Mistress Catherine was going into town today to do some shopping. One of the girls said that the mistress would be in town for a week. The girls envied whoever had the honor of escorting her this time. The maids knew that mistress was overly generous with those who went to the city with her, and one could receive a great many gifts. One of the servants said she had heard that Catherine would be taking little Susie with her this time. They noticed that the mistress was kind-heartedly treating the little girl as if she were her own daughter. Catherine dressed the main character in what seemed to be her hundredth dress. The passion of these women to dress up the protagonist in all kinds of dresses had no limits. Arnold came into the room to his mother and asked if Susie really needed to leave with her, and if so, he wanted to join them. Catherine replied to her son that she was going to buy things for the girls and he wouldn't be interested in going with them. The Baron's wife said that his father was also going to town and Arnold could join him with his older brother. The boy resented that in that case he and Susie wouldn't see each other for ages, and she would cry if he wasn't around. Catherine replied that she was able to manage on her own. Walking in the fresh air was very good for babies, and it was better than staying at home. Catherine, holding Susie in her arms, chuckled that, at least here, Arnold would not bother her. The main character looked around her with wide open eyes, now she knew what cities looked like in this world. There were many stone-paved houses all around. Everything resembled the Croatian city of Dubrovnik. From everywhere, there were words about the Tower of the Celestials and the priests. Susie thought that the inhabitants of this world believed in the existence of gods, and that it was the gods who gave people the power of witchcraft. The girl wanted to know what magic was all about and whether everyone was endowed with such powers. Passing by the shop windows, Catherine told the girl that it was Arnold's favorite pastry shop. The woman decided to go there and buy some sweets for everyone and hoped that Susie would like it there too. In the confectionery, three women were sitting at a table. They noticed that Lady Catherine had come in and she had the child with her that everyone was talking about. Susie had a bad feeling about this. The women greeted Catherine and said that given recent events regarding their family, it seemed that none of them would dare show their faces in public. One of those present said that the Baron had indeed gone too far. Catherine took a seat at the table with these ladies. They were curious if the Baron had revealed who he was having an affair with on the side. 
Behind the girl's sympathetic smile was a sneer. The gaze of these ladies was indifferent, without a hint of sympathy. Lady Catherine laughed and said it was nothing. The women continued to whisper that this child was the child of a mistress. These women were hurting Catherine, and it didn't matter what world they were in. No matter what age or social status, the strong always hurt and insult the weak. One of the ladies said that although this girl would not claim the inheritance, but if Catherine continued to let the Baron get away with such things, then one bastard will not be the only thing. The girl offered to help Catherine make arrangements with the abbots to send this child to a convent. Susie regurgitated directly at the girl sitting next to her. Catherine was worried that the baby had choked and said that it was not proper for well-mannered gentlemen to discuss such things in front of a small child. Susie said her first word and called Catherine mommy. The main character reached up and kissed the Baron's wife. The girls at the table with their mouths open watched what was happening. Catherine laughed and said that it was the baby was very attached to her and it was worth only to notice her mother as she immediately stopped crying in capriciousness. Catherine said that even though they were not related to each other, this little girl had become more dear than any other family. She asked the girls not to take it all to heart because there are times when a loving child can become more important than any life situation. One of the women told Catherine that they were of the same opinion and asked under whose care her sons were now. Another woman said they would skip the subject and introduced Lady Lucia, who had little opportunity to leave the royal palace. The queen herself had chosen Lucia's older sister to be a maid for the little prince, so she was now giving all her time to caring for his majesty's favorite. Susie, sipping her milk, realized that it was about Zhao. Lucia replied that it was all thanks to the king's favor, and yet her sister had a hard time, and it was rumored that the prince's previous maid was executed for unknown reasons, and the palace maid was changed every six months. Another girl laughed and said that the most important thing was that her sister was now earning a fortune. The other girls agreed and laughed. Susie, watching all this, pondered that everything was just as it was said in that book. In order to avoid leaking information about Zhao's true origin, his father was extremely strict with the servants in the palace. So far, everything that was happening was completely in line with the contents of the Flower Kingdom's history. It was mentioned in the book that the entire Weil family treated Susie beautifully, and with this family, she spent her short but peaceful childhood. Unfortunately, she grew up to be a mediocre, good-for-nothing person. After Ji Nuo and Zhao Ban learned of Susie's whereabouts, her life became a nightmare from which she could never escape. She was a pathetic puppet for the rest of her life. The protagonist decided that, since now, now Susie's life belongs to her, but for nothing will not put up with her fate. But she did not know how she could not repeat the fate of Susie from the book, because the girl had too little information. The protagonist realized that she needed more knowledge. In the bookstore, Susie found a book that she really needed. Catherine at this point was buying a large number of books for Arnold and was not sure that he was even capable of reading so much. The protagonist's hands were reaching for the book. Catherine, seeing that the little girl liked the book, took it in her hands and gave it to the girl. This book was about magic. Susie cradled the textbook in her hand and decided that was where she would start. When Catherine and the main character got home, this woman spread out a huge amount of toys, things, jewelry, and various little things in front of the little girl. Susie crawled over to this pile and picked up the very book that Catherine had bought her at the bookstore. The Baron's wife and the servants laughed. Catherine told them that Susie liked that book best. She didn't need anything else and the little girl wouldn't settle down until they bought that book. The maids were amazed and spoke of the goddess of wisdom herself coming down to earth in the guise of this little girl. The writing of this world was not the same as the writing of the world where the protagonist lived before. But it seemed that once she came to this world, she was able to understand everything written. On the continent of Xingyu, there were two versions of the origin of magic. One believed that the gods, when creating this world, spread their power throughout the land, and a spell was a kind of password to unlock these powers. People with a certain body constitution are able to unleash various divine powers indefinitely 
with the help of these spells. Others tend to believe that the world created by the gods is full of various elements, and the spells in turn are able to arrange these elements in a certain order. People born with a certain body structure have enough power to resonate with the elements through spells. This is how magic is born. After learning all this from the book, Susie decided that in order to master magic, one must learn spells. They must be taught from simple to complex, starting strictly with elementary spells. At that moment, one of the maids brought a toy in the form of a bee on a stick to the girl and tried to play with the little girl. Looking at this toy, Susie thought about the fact that the main disadvantage of being a small child was that adults never leave you alone. The protagonist turned her head and saw Morel sitting on the windowsill reading a book. He noticed the girl's gaze. She realized that this guy no living soul in this world would dare to disturb. And that's the beauty of being an adult. The entire Weil family gathered in the dining room for dinner. Catherine couldn't understand why Susie hadn't liked to sleep lately and wouldn't let go of the book. She wondered how such a small child could even understand what it said. Avery muttered to himself that the little girl was a witch. The older brothers looked at the boy angrily and he fell silent. Stefan, the head of the family, said that the child was growing up and it was normal. The Baron said that after a while, Susie would be old enough to sit at the table on her own and eat dinner with them. The man was really looking forward to when that would happen. Suddenly the lights went out everywhere and it became dark. Arnold shouted fearfully that it was a ghost. Catherine calmed her son and said that it was just an ordinary short circuit. She told the boy to calm down because he could scare his sister with his screams. Catherine said that the electricity would be out for a while and offered to light candles. She stroked the little girl's head so she wouldn't be afraid. The protagonist realized that there was electricity in this world. Mural made a few movements with his hand and a fire burst out of his palm, spreading throughout the dining room. Susie realized that this was magic at its most real. The candles around them lit up and it became bright again. Morel was in his room studying a book when suddenly he heard a knock on the door. When he opened it, he saw little Susie on the floor. The boy took the little girl by the scruff of the neck and brought her to Catherine. He told her to tell the maids to keep a better eye on the girl because she was crawling wherever her soul pleased. And it was not the first time he had found her near his room. Catherine told her son that the little girl just likes him, that's why she goes to him. Morel replied that the girl was distracting him and walked away. Catherine was clearly unhappy with her son's behavior. This world presented the protagonist with her first intractable problem, Mural. No matter how hard the girl tried, he remained completely indifferent to her. 15-year-old Mural, the very definition of a diligent student, or simply a crammer. Since general education is not yet common in the Flower Kingdom, Morel stood out for his intelligence and ability. At the age of 10, he was chosen by the royal wise men and, as an exception, was enrolled in the imperial school. This is the place where the royal family members study. A young man with a cold temperament, not interested in anything but studying. Arnold and Susie came to the imperial school's courtyard. Although it was really cool there, the boy resented why he had to drag himself there if his brother needed to fetch something. The protagonist at this moment was trying to figure out how to solve the problem with Morel. There was a crowd of girls around the older brother, one of whom was inviting him to go out to dinner together. At this point, Morel put Susie in his arms and replied to the girls that he needed to look after his sister. Arnold asked his older brother why he had lied. Merle said that the Duke's daughter had called him and they couldn't afford to insult her. The title of Baron was below everyone else in the hierarchy, and Mural was just the son of a Baron. Looking at Susie, the older brother said that this prop was so useful. The protagonist realized that he was up to something. In the auditorium of the Imperial School, Morel was sitting with Susie in his arms. The teacher was telling him that in order to create a fireball, one must first assess the composition of the elements in the environment, the difference in humidity and temperature. The teacher told that next you need to gather the element of fire around your palm, keep in your mind. Also, the spells could be different. If you want to master high-level spells, you must systematically engage in the study of various disciplines such as chemistry, physics, math, history. The protagonist tried so hard to get the favor of Mural. 
But everything was in vain. Now success caught up with her by sheer chance. Susie was glad of it. Suddenly, the elder brother poked the girl with his finger on her cheek. Morel had been covering for his sister everywhere and telling her that she needed to be looked after. On a day off, the older brothers were walking in the square. Morel carried Susie in his arms. Arnold was indignant and said that he had to carry her because his sister loved him the most. So began a new page of integration of the main character into this world. After five years, Baron Weil wrote a letter to the queen that everything was all right with the little princess, that she was intelligent, inquisitive, and kind. Everyone who met her praised her. The girl liked to read quietly beside Morel, to play in the open air with Arnold. They were very young and active. Stefan wrote that this girl was really a fairy, sent to them by the gods, and he was sure that it was because she had inherited the queen's great blood and hoped that soon the girl would be able to unite with her mother. The Baron handed the letter to his wife, asking her to give it to the secret envoy. He thought it was the last letter for the queen. Catherine asked her husband not to worry, because as long as everything is fine with Susie, the queen will be calm. The protagonist sat surrounded by maids. They said they wanted to hear her best tales again. Susie was thinking about what to tell them, because this time it was not about the prince and princess and it was necessary to change the heroes. The girl herself did not expect that her fairy tales would be so popular. Five years passed imperceptibly. In the book it was said that it is very important to win the hearts of people and make connections. This time Susie will not be a helpless girl who is bullied by everyone. The main character began to tell the maids that there was a little girl. She was loved by everyone and called Red Riding Hood. One day little Red Riding Hood went into the forest to take food to her grandmother. The Baron and his wife watched the girl from the window, and Stefan talked about Susie being an unusual child. Catherine also thought she was very smart and caring for a child of five. Everyone noticed that she was acting like an adult. It seemed to Baron that perhaps this behavior of the little girl was not good. He said that if one was a prominent person in their country, they might be chosen by someone in the royal family or ministers. Stefan felt that the queen would want Susie to live in peace and safety rather than be at court. Besides, the girl's identity had to be kept secret. Morel entered his parents' room and said that Susie was over five years old. He recalled that when he and his brothers were three years old, they had already hired their first teacher for them. Guy said that whatever direction they chose, it was important to learn the basics. The older son told his parents that he spent most of his time at school, so he couldn't teach the girl all the time. He didn't understand what his parents were trying to accomplish. Morel said that Susie is very smart and even smarter than him at that age. If she gets a good education, then in the future all people will pay attention to her. Catherine realized that this was what bothered the Baron the most. She said that she wanted Susie to always be near her. The son didn't understand why his mother wanted that. Stefan intervened in the conversation and said that Susie was too young and it was too early to worry about it. The servants were discussing that the Baron was quarreling with young Mr. Morel. One of them heard that it was because of Mrs. Susie. Another servant said that Mr. Morel was always indifferent, and it was strange that he was crossing the Baron because of young Mrs. Susie. Avery overheard the maids talking and moved closer under the door to overhear the conflict between the Baron and his son. Stefan said that now was not the time to discuss the matter. The eldest son explained that he didn't understand if this girl was being treated individually because others said she was an illegitimate daughter. Catherine tried to stop this scandal. Morel said it wasn't fair and left the room. Avery called out to him. The younger son didn't understand why his older brother only cared about the little witch. His mother and brothers used to be very fond of the younger one, but after Susie came into the family, everything changed. When Morel took Susie to school with him, Avery asked to go with them, but in response, he heard that outsiders were forbidden to enter the school. The boy thought it was all unfair. Susie tried to make contact, but Avery said that he would never accept her. The protagonist realized that it was impossible to like all people. She realized that she didn't like Avery because of Morel. At home, only younger son did not accept her, an illegitimate daughter. Susie sat with Arnold in his room. He was doing his homework and resented that his best years were passing 
and a way had to be found to go out and play. The girl reflected on the fact that Morel wanted her to get the same elementary education as her big brothers, but Catherine and Vile didn't really approve. The main character speculated that the Baron is worried that if she agrees, she will get too good an education, and if she, like Morel, is liked by someone in the royal palace, the secret of her identity might be revealed. In the history book, it was said that Susie died because of her identity being revealed. She realized that if she did not get an education, she would become an ordinary weak person and could only accept her fate. The protagonist realized that both positions were true, but she couldn't let her family fight over her. The girl nervously slammed the book shut. Arnold asked his sister what had happened. Susie replied that she would find Brother Morel and come back. Arnold reacted strongly to these words, thinking that his sister was not happy with him. It seemed to him that Susie thought he was stupid because he could not do his homework. The protagonist came to his older brother's room. They were sitting at the table across from each other. Susie was saying that this was not the way to do it. Morel asked the girl why she did not want to learn. Did she really think she could learn everything by herself? The older brother assumed that Susie didn't like that he had a fight with her father, and she heard that since she was an illegitimate daughter, she was treated individually. Mural said that such behavior could confirm other people's speculation, and it would embarrass the family. Susie replied that she doesn't care what other people think, and she knows that her parents and brothers and love her very much. The girl said that was enough for her. The brother patted the main character on the head and asked her not to worry, because from now on, he would not quarrel with his parents. He asked his sister to wait, for he had a plan. The maids were bringing treats to the living room because a foreign guest had arrived at the manor. Susie looked into the living room and saw there her older brother and another man. The guest was a doctor of science named David. He admired Morel and explained that he was here mainly because of the boy's future development, which he wanted to discuss with his parents. The man said that he had recently approached the king about expanding educational facilities for their country. This was how the Enlightenment proposal was prepared. David said that law alone was not enough, and without good manpower, it was useless. This country urgently needed well-trained people. The doctor of science suggested to the baron and his wife that their eldest son could go into the field of education in the future. The guest said that he knew that Morel planned to continue his studies, and he hoped that the boy would pass his exam and develop in the field of education. The eldest son felt that his plans should be approved by his parents. Weil and his wife said it was great, and their family was honored to receive Dr. David's recognition. The maids were bringing treats into the living room, and Susie was watching what was going on in the room. Suddenly, the protagonist pushed one of the maids, and she dropped the spread of food. The girl began to apologize and said that she didn't mean to do that. The attention of everyone present was fixed on Susie. Merle told his sister to join them. The older brother introduced the main character to Dr. David. The guest replied that he could not even imagine that a cold and indifferent guy would have a younger sister whom he loves so much. Morel replied that it was not love, but rather mutual respect. The older brother asked Susie to greet the older brother's teacher, Dr. David. He told her that the man was a famous scientist. The protagonist remembered that this man was mentioned in a history book. He was a famous pioneer teacher and a favorite of the king. The Baron told Susie to rather say hello to the guest and understood that the eldest son wanted Dr. David's favor towards Susie. Stefan realized that if the girl entered the royal school, her identity might be revealed. The Baron believed that Susie could not be allowed to show herself too well, could not arouse his interest. The girl mentally apologized to her older brother and hid behind his leg. Morel realized that something was wrong. Stefan asked the girl what was wrong and told her to say hello to the guest, but the little girl remained silent. She was reacting the way the Baron wanted her to. In the eyes of the adults, David was an ordinary scholar who doesn't leave a bad impression. The guest said that such a reaction of the girl is quite normal because she is still a child. Mural lifted the girl in his arms and asked her to name the 100 digits after the decimal point of pi. The girl cried and said she couldn't. The older brother said she wasn't his sister and asked for the real Susie back. In the dining room, Catherine and Susie helped the maids put food on their plates. 
The protagonist realized that the critical moment had passed and Dr. David was not interested in her. Weil and Catherine breathed a sigh of relief. Susie heard them talking about Her Majesty the Queen, the biological mother of this body. The girl hadn't seen her since she was born. Catherine praised Susie, and she contemplated sneaking a peek. Morel was sitting in the living room with her father and Dr. David. He was talking about how Ji Nuo was a great strategist, and he had suppressed the chaos in the Southwest and Lin Bay Peninsula all these years. Soon, the rest of the Lin clan people were supposed to be back in control of their country. Morel said that in the history of the state, the current king was the greatest ruler. David added that his majesty was invincible in wars, he only needed to placate the queen to stabilize the world. Queen Alita comes from a noble family. She is gentle, kind, a blessing to the entire state. Unexpectedly, Susie appeared in the living room and told everyone that she heard that the famous poet Hyde had written a poem of praise. A graceful flower that will never wither or die, for its summer will never end. At that very second, Susie realized that she had unknowingly quoted a poem about the queen from a history book. David applauded and said it wasn't bad. Morel wondered how the girl recognized the poem. A guest asked Susie the same thing. The protagonist realized there was no turning back and said she had heard people say that Her Majesty was the kindest and gentlest in the world. There was a bard at the manor who recited the verse and she learned it. David, holding a letter in his hand, said that he seemed to have found a suitable candidate. The guest said that the queen was kind, and every year she organized a palace banquet in the capital and invited people of different classes to it. The queen had respect for educated people. This was a great chance for the queen's bright eyes to notice them. David passed the envelope into the girl's hands and said that if the queen knew that a five-year-old child knew by heart the verse praising her, she would be very pleased. Susie looked questioningly at the Baron. He realized that allowing the girl to attend the palace banquet was quite risky, but it was the Queen's banquet, and she had not seen Susie for five years. It was an opportune moment for them to meet, and there might not be an opportunity to see each other later. The Baron thanked Dr. David and said it was an honor. Weil stroked Susie's head. The guest asked to prepare carefully for the banquet and the meeting with the Queen. Catherine and the maids were dressing Susie, trying on different outfits. The mistress thought that now they would be able to attend the royal reception as a family, all thanks to this little girl. Ever since the vile family had fallen into decline, their family had simply disappeared to other people for 20 years. The estate was in chaos. Arnold was picking out hats that could match his stunning face. The etiquette teacher was teaching Morel how to behave properly with a lady. Avery angrily watched from the sidelines as the whole thing unfolded. The youngest of her brothers was approached by Susie and asked him to go together to the royal reception. The girl hoped that he would agree and urged him strongly. The boy devalued the upcoming event and said he would not go. At the royal palace, David, the scholar, asked the king to consider that all beings in this vast world should receive the same education, regardless of class. David said that the royal family was descended from God, who created the world but that there were also people with talents among the common people. He cited an example, his student, who surpasses him in talent a thousand times over. David said that a king should take care of the happiness of his kingdom, and only then, the flower kingdom, will have talents gifted by God and his ruler. The scholars believe that if they provided education to everyone in the kingdom, they would have more people who could be a support in the future. That was the good thing for the flower kingdom. The ruler agreed and told him to draw up a decree on universal education for these old men in the council to consider. David thanked the king and asked for another request. The scholar said that his student had already been adopted into the family and he would be a reliable support for the Royal Institute in the future, as well as an additional teacher in the Royal Court Institute. The scholar said that his disciple had a younger sister who was legally ineligible but very talented. The king was harsh and said he would not indulge other people's desires and women were forbidden to study. Jinuo hated women. David replied that this child was special and she was already able to learn rare poems by heart at the age of five, a very malleable and bright girl. The scholar asked the king to allow her to study at the Royal Institute and she was from a noble family 
the fourth child of the Vale family. During the reign of the former king, this family was famous for its repeated battle honors. David gave the ruler the information about Susie, along with her picture. Ji Nuo replied that he understood and told David to leave. The king looked carefully at the information about the girl and eventually threw everything in the trash can. It was time for the event and the Weil family entered the banquet hall. Even Avery still came. Susie looked around at the royal palace and she had a feeling of deja vu. The girl could smell the scent of Her Majesty the Queen. It had been five years and Susie was back in this place again. The banquet was in full swing. Arnold marveled at how many aristocrats and overseas guests he had never seen before. Mural asked his brother not to exaggerate and said that this was just a handout from the royal family, meant to placate and maintain control over their vassals. The detention policy is a managerial method used by ancient dynasties to tame the control of independent territories and vassals. Mural tells us that the queen comes from a noble family. The queen's family is renowned for battle honors for centuries. They have conquered territories for the sake of their kingdom. Her Majesty's mercy and generosity let the Flower Kingdom develop further. Mural said that thanks to the king's permission, the queen organizes a banquet once a month. Catherine stood by her husband's side and said how sorry she was that Her Majesty the Queen couldn't attend the reception due to her health. It looks like Susie won't be able to meet her mother this time. The woman wished for Her Majesty to recover soon. Susie sighed sadly and looked at the empty royal throne. She approached her father and said she needed to go to the restroom and could go by herself. According to the novella, Susie never met the queen again. But now that she was in the palace, she must have already influenced the course of events. The protagonist periodically found herself in a completely unfamiliar place by accident. In her past life, she had a harmless but incurable disease, topographical cretinism. The protagonist was lost and didn't know what to do. She wandered around the neighborhood of the palace and suddenly heard someone's voice behind her. Turning around, she saw the king, who was trying to understand how someone could be here. Catherine asked the girl to promise that when she was in the palace, she would not talk to anyone but the queen, and the girl promised that she wouldn't. But now she had met the king himself and didn't know what to do now. Susie came across this bastard, Ji Nuo. The heroine had already imagined in her head how she was trying to escape, and she was caught by the knights and killed. There was a terrifying aura emanating from the ruler that was impossible to ignore. He was like a devil. Ji Nuo asked the protagonist who she was. The little girl didn't know what to do and was afraid that she might be killed, but she remembered that he didn't know who she was. No matter how hard Susie tried, she couldn't contain the trembling in her body. She looked at the expression on Ji Nuo's face. She thought he sympathized, but it was probably disgust. The ruler looked at the girl and said that she was a pathetic child, a weak, frightened creature that looked bewildered like a stray, stray dog. The king asked one of the knights where the child came from. It was explained to the ruler that the queen was holding a reception at the palace today, and the child must have come from there. The servants thought that the little girl had insulted the king's gaze and should be punished. But Ji Nuo replied that there was no need to do so and asked him to escort the girl back. Outside the banquet hall, people watched as the guards led the little girl. They asked the court ladies to escort the little girl inside. The guests were discussing what was happening when they saw the girl being led by the king's guards and said that she was lucky. Susie thought that perhaps it was indeed good luck that she had her head on her shoulders. The guards took Susie to the banquet. Catherine and her older brother came to her immediately. They thought the girl was missing. The protagonist apologized for making them worry and told them she was lost, but the guards escorted her back. Susie decided not to talk about the fact that she had met that bastard Ji Nuo, or they would worry even more. Catherine said they should hurry back because everyone was worried about the baby girl. Susie lay in her crib and remembered her meeting with the king. Seeing the man again made her feel the breath of death even clearer, and she was very tired of that feeling. Catherine and her sons were drinking tea at the table. They had noticed that Susie had been acting strangely since she had returned from the palace. Catherine did not understand what was happening to her daughter. It seemed that she had a heavy heart. 
because she did not say a word. Merle asked if her sister was still asleep. Catherine replied that she had sent the maid to her, and the little girl would come later. The eldest son said that the girl had never acted like this before, and suggested that she might be sick. Avery suggested that perhaps the girl had been cursed. Catherine tapped her youngest son on the head and told him to be quiet. Mural remembered the look in the girl's eyes as her guards led her back to the banquet. He tried to understand what she had seen in the palace. Ji Nuo sat in his office and pondered about the little girl he had met in the vicinity of the palace during the banquet. He couldn't figure out where he had seen her, and glancing at the trash can, he suddenly remembered that he had thrown away the information about the gifted girl David had mentioned. Pulling the sheets out of the garbage can, he looked at the picture of the little girl and realized that it was her, the stray dog. Mural entered the office of the headmaster of the royal school. Dr. David had sought him out to bring him some news. The scientist told him that he had done his best to help with his request and, as a result, Susie was able to attend the royal school. Morel thanked David. The scientist warned the boy not to rejoice in advance because the interview would be conducted by the king himself. The older brother hurried to rejoice and told everything to Susie. He explained that if she passed the interview with the king, she would be allowed to attend the royal school. Mural congratulated the girl, but she looked very sad. In the king's meeting room, they were discussing the universal education law issued by David. One of the people present said that this law stated that secular schools should be built in the territory of every noble family to educate the commoners. A man was clearly not in agreement with this law and thought it was nonsense and that it would take a huge amount of money. The other man agreed and said that they should not do the work of the abbey. The education of people on the continent has been done by the Pope for centuries, so let him continue to do this nonsense. Those present in the meeting room did not understand why commoners should be educated and thought that David was wrong. They asked the king not to make such a decree. A servant leaned over to the ruler and said it was time. Susie stood in the royal palace with several servants who told her to wait there until she was called. It was the royal interview. The protagonist was brought there all alone and left in such a huge palace. Now Susie was starting to get nervous. It would have been easier for her if Morel had been around. Susie stood all alone and no one came to her. The king and his aide were watching her from above. It was obvious that the little girl was scared. Ji Nuo said that she was afraid. She was weak and didn't know what to do. The king noticed that the girl was quite savvy and thoughtful. Moreover, she behaved more mature than her age, and she was not as simple as she seemed. The ruler decided to take a closer look at her and went down to Susie. Seeing Ji Nuo, the protagonist was not confused and greeted the king. She noticed his gaze and assumed that he might have been watching her all this time. The girl assumed that it was something like a surprise inspection, and she needed to pull herself together. The king asked the girl why she wasn't afraid of him. Susie realized that the last time she saw him, she was very scared. The little girl did not know how to act, because according to the novel, the king is extremely cruel. His mood changes like the weather, and she needs to be careful. The protagonist replied to the ruler that her mother had told her that His Majesty the King should be honored like God, so she should not be afraid of him. Susie added that she was not afraid of him last time, but was only afraid of the unknown in the darkness. The girl went on to say that only evil people who have no idea what status is, and people with the proper status, would not dare to do anything inappropriate. The girl realized that she had piled three boxes of praise on the king, and since he had the highest status after these words he would not punish her. Of course, all of Susie's words were not true, but the king was not angry, although he guessed that the girl said all this not from the heart. This kind of speech was the most familiar to him. It was as if he saw himself from the side when he was a little boy, because he also answered to the one who sat on the throne. Jinuo asked the protagonist if she wanted to study at the royal school. The girl answered that she wanted to. She realized that the Rubicon had been crossed and there was nowhere to retreat to. Going to the royal school would mean putting herself in danger, perhaps because her identity would be revealed before her time. Susie realized that this was the place where all the minds of the kingdom gathered. If she can become the best wizard, she will be able to control her own destiny. And it was the truth. In the end, the protagonist had to have tea with the king. 
He asked Susie why she wanted to study, since she was only five or six years old. Why sacrifice this wonderful time to study books? Susie replied firmly that she wanted to become a wizard. Jinuo said that this girl was recommended by David himself for a reason, and it was probably him who taught her such words, not to give importance to kinship and inheritance by blood, to indulge in crazy dreams of achievements in the future. The protagonist replied that the king, one of the most famous wizards in the entire continent, and her brother said that this was the highest achievement of the royal family in the last centuries, far surpassing the achievements of the previous ruler. Susie told the king that he was much stronger than the previous ruler, and she thought that was cool. The king's aide intervened in the conversation and said that he thought his majesty was cool too. The king gave him a stern look. Jinuo asked Susie about her brother who is studying in the royal school. The protagonist said that Morel is the best, and he entered the school without entrance exam. The girl realized that this king didn't seem to be that scary. The ruler asked Susie what she could do, what her specialties were. He wanted to test the girl and reminded her that they had an interview. The protagonist assumed that he wanted to confuse her with such a question, and she needed to consolidate success and show herself at her best. The girl realized that, most likely, the king would not be impressed by low-order magic and tried to figure out how to surprise him. Susie came up with an idea and told the king that she could read out loud the number pi and tell the value to the hundredths by heart. The protagonist started to read out the number and everyone around was shocked and the servants, the king's assistant, and Jinuo himself. The girl felt some strange feeling again. The king called the servants and told them to escort Susie out of the palace. The king's aide said that he had checked the girl's answer with evaluation magic. She wasn't wrong by a single digit. This girl was indeed not easy. Only the past ruler knew the exact value of the number pi. Only the royal sister of the current king could tell the number from memory. Sister Ji Nuo was famous for her education, good memory, and was the only one who could memorize the numerical value at the age of five. The servants led Susie to the carriage. She did not understand what was happening or if she had made a mistake. The servants came in to see the king, but he was very angry, pulled out a sword and chopped a candle that was in the hands of one of the maids. He told them to get out of here and leave him alone. Rumors spread that the king had gone away in a rage after an audience with the daughter of the Vile family. The main character's mind raged with restless thoughts, and so a whole week passed. The girl was glad that Jinuo didn't order the punishment of her kind. Dr. David called Susie and Morel to stay at his estate, and it seemed that he wanted to discuss something important with them. Catherine realized that Susie had not yet traveled so far from home. Her mother asked the girl how she was feeling, and perhaps she was missing something. The protagonist answered that everything was fine and she was not afraid of anything near her brother. It seemed to Susie that David had invited the girl specially for her to unwind after the incident. Murel promised father that he would take care of his sister. The Baron wondered if Dr. David himself had indicated Susie's candidacy. Murel replied to his father that it was true, and the teacher was a close confidant of the emperor, so it was unlikely that the emperor was so angry. Besides, it was unclear how a ruler who owned an entire kingdom could take offense at a child. Avery called his brother cruel and said that their family was in grave danger and he was running away with that witch to save her. Merle took his younger brother by the scruff of the neck and calmed him down. Merle asked his sister if she was still worried about the meeting. Susie thought that he was purposely giving her a chance to unwind and she didn't want him to worry about her. The little girl answered her brother that everything was fine at first, and then she didn't realize what had happened. The king suddenly became gloomy and quickly withdrew. Mural stroked his sister's head and said that it was nothing, because even if she was not allowed to study, she was still able to get Dr. David's recognition. And the king in general is very often angry without reason, so there is no need to worry. The protagonist was shocked if it was possible to speak so directly about the king. Her brother replied to the girl that there are no strangers here. Susie cried, started waving her hands and saying that it was the jerk king was very angry. Her brother calmed the girl down and said that she was the first person to have a private interview with his majesty. Susie hugged her brother tightly. 
She felt much better after talking to Morel and speculated that perhaps he had magic to soothe people's hearts. The protagonist and her brother arrived at the Earl of Devonhill Manor. They were already met by Dr. David and his servants. Muriel apologized to the teacher for disturbing him. The scholar asked the boy not to worry and said he had a lot of papers he would need to sort through. Susie looked around and reflected that this was what the estate of Dr. David, the great scientist known all over the country, looked like. It was very beautiful. Ji Nuo arrived at David's palace with his assistant, who said that it looked like the doctor had a guest. The king replied that the ruler of an entire kingdom should not defer to others. At the Earl's Devonhill estate in the king's hunting park, Dr. David spoke to Ji Nuo about not knowing he was going to visit them and apologized for not being able to greet them. The scholar said he would immediately order the manor to be sealed off from guests so that no one would disturb the king. Ji Nuo said he shouldn't do that. The ruler explained that he was bored in the palace, so he came here to have some fun. The king also heard that David had invited the scientists to his place and asked what for. The man explained that that was right. If the decree on universal education was approved, then materials would have to be prepared and presented to the king for his consideration. David said that, at this moment, the scholars were gathered at his estate, and if they knew that his majesty would be so interested in the educational materials and would personally inspect them, they would be touched by the honor. David rejoiced and told the king how impressed he was, and tomorrow morning, he would tell the scholars to welcome him. Ji Nuo replied that there was no need to try to anticipate his actions. The king went for a walk and told the scholar to mind his own business. The next day, David looked for the king. The maids told him that his majesty had gone hunting since morning. The man realized that the emperor's actions were difficult to predict and he needed to be resilient to such changes. Susie and her brother were sitting at the dinner table. The girl thought that it was very cool there, just paradise, and wanted to live like that always. Everything in the Count's estate is imbued with the atmosphere of literature and art. The little girl ran around the estate and marveled at how many antiques there are. But suddenly, Soyuzi realized that she hadn't brought any pretty dresses with her and told her brother about it. Mural, with a snap of his fingers, changed the outfit that his sister was wearing. The protagonist realized that her brother had the magic of changing outfits. Her brother explained to Susie that it was nothing, and it was a middle-class magic that only lasted for a quarter of an hour. The girl replied that a second was enough, and she would be the most beautiful and fashionable in the neighborhood. Morel kept the girl company for a couple of days, and then began to work on the paperwork that Dr. David had assigned him. The protagonist came to the library and there were a lot of people there. Those people were compiling study materials for the basic training manual of the Flower Kingdom. David was telling Morel that the study materials should cover all branches. The guy replied that he thought they should add the ancient language of the kingdom, but they shouldn't add in-depth knowledge. Leave something like song breakdowns, which was in everyone's ears. David announced that they still haven't come up with a name for the study guide. The name should be formal and solemn, but not too fancy. Susie suggested naming the standard manual of compulsory education, the education that everyone in the kingdom must receive, educational education. Susie was asked why she wanted to equate education with labor and make it compulsory, since getting an education should be a happy event. The protagonist said that only through a system of independent education, which becomes compulsory for every resident, can access to education be made available to everyone. David was amazed and decided that's what they would call the system. The scientist could not have imagined that a little girl would be able to express in one word the meaning of his dream that he had been chasing all his life. He believed that a strong youth was a strong country, and that was the kind of talent he needed. David told Morel that his sister was a treasure. The servants entered and announced that His Majesty the King had arrived. When the ruler entered the room, Susie smelled a very strong odor of blood and fainted. Upon waking up, the protagonist did not realize where she was. She fainted because of the blood and wanted to know where she was and how she got here. Servants stood near the bed and told Susie that she fainted and His Majesty brought her here. These are the chambers prepared by Earl David for the king at Devonhill Manor. The girl told the protagonist 
that the king, having killed the bear, wanted to bestow the scholars, but no one knew that the little girl would be so frightened. The bear was really very big and scary, and only His Majesty the King could kill it so quickly. Susie jumped out of bed in horror when she recognized that she was in Jinuo's chambers. The girl shouted that she had to go back. The servant replied that the little girl should rest and her brother would be working late at the library. The protagonist decided to go to the library to find her brother. He was obviously very busy. Susie did not want to distract him from his business. Mural in this world burned his business, and nothing should distract him. The girl decided to go to the restroom. The ruler of the Flower Kingdom also came to the restroom. He told the servants that he didn't need to be accompanied and they could go. Jinuo sat down on the sofa, taking a glass in his hands. Nearby, Susie was leafing through a book. They were the only idlers in the entire manor. The ruler watched carefully as the girl read the book. The protagonist stood up and tried to reach for the sweets that were on the table, but she couldn't reach them. Susie approached the king and asked him to get a piece of cake called Black Forest. The girl explained that she couldn't get it and he was the only adult in the room. G put the girl a piece of cake and she thanked him happily. The king looked at the girl carefully, an image of his sister appeared in his mind. He compared them and decided that they were completely different. The king's aide entered the lounge and saw that the girl was asking the ruler to serve her more dessert. The aide was horrified to realize that his majesty was serving cakes for a little girl. What surprised him the most was that Miss Susie herself had asked for the king's favor. Jinuo headed towards the exit. His assistant said that Madame Susie's character is so benevolent and she is not vindictive at all. The guard said that it was the girl who was so mature. The king replied that she was just a little girl and told him to get to the point. The aide handed the emperor an envelope and said that they had just received a secret message from the crown prince of the Boer Empire. The letter was sent by messenger. The ruler opened the envelope and took out a letter from there. Mural and Susie were eating dinner at the table. The brother was apologizing for not being able to give the girl time today. He said he should have stayed with her ever since she fainted, but that would have been a dereliction of duty on his part. Susie replied that he had been determined to live on the estate. It was the king's order, and he could not go against it. The girl did not blame her brother at all. Besides, she was fine. Mural understood that his sister was in the manor, thanks to the king's favor. Somewhere in the back of his mind, his older brother was not entirely happy that Susie was here, for royalty had taken away his right to see his own family as well, even at such an important time. He felt that the king's concept of kinship was completely lacking. The protagonist replied that his brother's thoughts were very impertinent. Merle explained that it was all true and wondered if Susie still favored the king. Logically, the girl should have hated the ruler because he sent her away as a baby and forcibly separated her from her mother. But the girl was happy about the smallest things he did for her. The protagonist decided that she was not acting quite sensibly and needed to ignore the ruler. Mural put a beautiful hat on his sister's head and said that it was his gift. Susie walked around the neighborhood of the palace and admired the hat given by her brother. Suddenly, a huge bluebird came out of nowhere and tried to take the hat away from the girl. Susie held the hat tightly and the bird managed to tear off only one flower. Standing on a tree branch was a guy in a white shirt with brown hair. The bird that had taken the flower from Susie's hat flew over and perched on his arm. He asked the bird if she was really that beautiful. Susie was looking out the window as suddenly that darn blue hawk appeared again. It was like he was taunting the girl, knowing she couldn't do anything to him. The main character ran outside and chased the bird. Susie tried to catch the hawk and called the creature a silly bird. The girl didn't see where she was running and ducked right into the king, who was with Dr. David and his guards. The emperor's aide asked the protagonist if she wanted to go back on the carriage with the emperor. Susie clarified if she could. The girl thought she had embarrassed herself because of the stupid bird. The protagonist got into the carriage with the emperor. She couldn't believe that this rascal actually allowed her to get into his carriage. The girl realized that if she went back now, her brother would be left at Devon Hill Manor to compile study materials. On the other hand, the girl realized that Catherine and Arnold would surely miss her, 
and Brother Morel would finally be able to concentrate on his work. The Emperor at that moment was thinking about the fact that his assistant Hampton had completely gotten off his hands and put the girl in his carriage. The Emperor looked at Susie and decided that if she was capricious, he would throw her out of the carriage. The girl saw the same hawk circling above them that had caused her to run down the street and run into G. The protagonist fell asleep. In her sleep, she called out for her mom and dad and didn't realize where she was. The emperor took her hand and told her he was near. Hampton shouted that there were assassins around and told the guards to protect the king. The battle began. Susie watched frightened at what was happening. Looking through the carriage window, the girl saw one of the assassins pierce one of the guards with his sword. Jinuo covered the girl's eyes with his palm and told her not to look at what was happening. A huge green serpent rose above the scene of the battle. The emperor got out of the carriage, calling everyone around him pathetic bugs and ordered everyone to be killed. One of the knight's guards approached the second carriage. There was a boy riding in it who said he was fine and they were well prepared. Ever since the ruler received the secret message from Crown Prince Yu Jail, he had begun preparations. Their country might not be the largest, but they had plenty of grand wizards in the Great Wizards. The boy asked about Susie, how she was feeling. They approached the protagonist, who was sitting with her hands covering her eyes. The boy began to calm her down and told her that nothing was wrong. Opening her eyes, the protagonist saw blood and lost consciousness. The attendants brought the protagonist home. Hampton said goodbye to the girl and told her he was going back. Susie thanked in return. The girl was met by the Baron and his wife and two brothers. The protagonist happily ran to her family. She hugged Arnold, who was happy that she was finally back. He talked about how much he missed her. Avery didn't like everything that was going on. Walking through the estate, the protagonist remembered seeing someone else besides Hampton and the pig emperor. Susie wondered who the second carriage belonged to and who was riding in it. Susie ran into Avery, who asked why the girl reeked of black magic. The protagonist replied that those who had learned the secret had long since left this world. The brother bounced off his sister and said that she was just scaring him. Susie replied that he was saying scary things to her too, and now they were even. The girl walked away. Avery watched her sister follow and it seemed to him that she had changed somehow. The emperor was in his chambers. The maids were taking off his clothes, and Hampton was announcing that the welcoming ceremony and banquet for the arrival of the honored guest from the Kingdom of Boar was scheduled for next Wednesday. Hampton worried what would happen if Her Majesty the Queen could not attend. The Emperor replied, let her do as she wishes. In that case, it was unclear who would accompany the Emperor. The King replied that he was not obliged to come accompanied by anyone the great king could appear in public without a woman's presence. The aide gave the ruler a list of those invited to the banquet and asked him to familiarize himself with it. Jinuo noticed that Andy had invited Susie Weil, he told the aide to invite Lady Ju Ruo, and ask her to come to the banquet with Princess Hua Xing. At the Weil family's estate, Susie was writing a letter to her dear brother Morel. In the letter, the girl said that he couldn't even imagine how she got to the manor and who they met on the way. Susie did not understand whether it was even possible to tell what had happened. The main character heard some noise outside the window and looked outside. She looked around carefully and found that there was no one there, so she assumed that she might have heard it. Perhaps she was too absorbed in her thoughts. Susie went back to the table to continue writing the letter, and in the tree in front of the window sat a boy with a hawk and laughed at the fact that the girl had not realized to look up. He just wanted to apologize. For that time, Susie had fainted because of him. The boy decided he would apologize at the banquet. Susie entered the banquet hall in a beautiful outfit, accompanied by servants. People were trying to figure out who this girl was because she was treated like an important guest, and even dukes were probably not treated like that. It was said that the banquet was organized in honor of the arrival of a guest of their kingdom, Boar, the guests assumed that this girl could be a princess. The king arrived at the celebration. He was accompanied by the youngest princess by title, the sixth princess Hua Xing, and her mother Lady Juju. The king had never appeared accompanied by minions before. It seems that Lady Ju Ruoju's troubles were now behind him. And at this moment, the king had two favorites. 
people were whispering about what happened to the queen and why she was absent. Rumor has it that the queen wants to sacrifice herself for the little prince, and she has already gone to the god tower. Upon hearing this, Susie was shocked that the queen of the great power had imprisoned herself in the tower because she had voluntarily decided to serve God. It seemed absurd. The girl realized that she didn't go there for the well-being of the prince, for it wasn't even her child. Susie felt that it was all because of her. Lady Juju is going out for the first time with Princess Hua Xing. Previously, the king only loved Prince Jiaoban, but now it seems that things have changed. The emperor told the little princess to come over. The little girl said she wanted to dance a dance for her father. Hua Xing, wearing a beautiful purple dress, began to dance. Susie was sighing heavily at this moment and thinking about her mother. The main character was patted on the shoulder by someone. She turned around and saw a boy. He called Susie by name. She asked in surprise how he knew her. This same boy was then riding in a neighboring carriage when the emperor's crew was attacked by assassins. The protagonist had fainted from the sight of blood and didn't remember this boy, though he held her in his arms. The young boy turned his head toward the emperor, around whom the little princess was dancing, and asked Susie if she was jealous of her. The boy thought that usually girls dreamed of becoming princesses, bathing in everyone's attention, wearing pretty dresses. The stranger held out his hand to Susie and offered to meet her. He said his name was Andy. The boy was called by one of the guards and said that the emperor wanted to see him and introduce him as an honored guest. As he left, Andy asked the girl to wait for him and smiled enigmatically. Susie looked after him and did not realize if they knew each other or who this boy was. The emperor of the flower kingdom introduced the prince of the boar kingdom to everyone in the banquet hall. It was the same Andy, the prince of the empire. Ji Nuo placed a wreath on the head of the guest of honor. The emperor was looking at someone in the crowd with his eyes. Seeing the emperor's gaze, Hampton asked who he was looking for. Ji Nuo said that there were no children at the banquet, and later, during the masquerade ball, Andy and Hua Xing would miss their friends. The king's aide realized he wanted to ask about Miss Susie. Hampton said he missed that girl too, and had seen her recently, but there was no time to say hello. The aide promised to escort Prince Andy, Princess Hua Xing, and Miss Susie to the dance hall later. The emperor told his aide to shut up. During the masquerade ball, it was the royal family's custom to blur the boundaries between the upper and lower classes. On this night, people showed their true emotions and had fun until they fell. The same was true for small children. In the short story of Flower Kingdom, when Susie met the queen, she was already in God's tower, just like the previous queen. The main character thought that she needed to find a way to meet her mother in the tower. Dancing around Susie was Hua Xing, who suddenly screamed and accused the protagonist of hitting her. The princess asked Susie as an apology to change into her servant's clothes because they resembled each other in figure and also both wearing masks and someone might mistakenly think she was Princess Hua Xing. Susie was furious, not realizing what was going on. The little princess thought she was right. The protagonist suggested that the girl hit her and change into the ruler's clothes because she wouldn't want people to confuse them either. A conflict arose between the girls. Andy approached the girls. He told Susie that he had been looking for her all this time and put a flower wreath on the girl's head. The main character asked Andy if he knew who she was. Hui Xing pulled Susie back and told Andy that he must have been looking for her. The princess was sure that probably the prince was wrong. She wanted the flower wreath too. Andy scratched the back of his head and asked the girl who she was. Hua Xing wanted the flower wreath and cried about Susie getting all the attention. Andy twitched and begged the princess not to cry. Susie, looking at all of this, thought about how stupid the man was. The main character told Hua Xing not to pretend and gave her the wreath given to Andy saying that she didn't need it anyway. The princess was angry and Susie beautifully and hastily left there. Andy, looking at the departing girl, could not let her go and grabbed her hand. He said that this wreath belonged to the Flower Kingdom and perhaps she would like it. He held out a gold bracelet to Susie. Hua Xing watched what was going on and got angry. Her mother came up to the princess and asked what was going on. 
The girl showed the scratches on her arm and said that no one had hurt her. Susie tried to find out from Andy why he was giving her jewelry. He called the girl a fool and said that this jewelry belongs to her now. If the girl doesn't take it, it will end up in the trash. The main character agreed and put the bracelet on her arm. She thought about the fact that this is a very petulant boy and pondered how old he was. Some strange man approached Susie and asked to come with him, saying that he wanted to meet the girl. The stranger walked in front and the protagonist walked behind. She asked who was looking for her and on what business. Suddenly the man grabbed the girl and covered her mouth with his palm to stop her from screaming. Susie realized that this was bad and something had to be done. The main character remembered the fireball that Morel was making. Susie concentrated and magically conjured the fireball. The man let the girl go and said he just wanted to teach her a lesson. He asked how dare this child attack him and started making death threats. The stranger turned into a monster with long claws. Susie already thought that she was finished, as suddenly Andy appeared and snatched the girl right out of the clutches of the monster. The prince asked the protagonist if she was okay. Susie noticed a wound on his shoulder and told him he was hurt. Andy thought he had made a mistake and asked Susie to stand in one place and not move. He called the monster a puppet that reeked of soul sacrifice magic. The monster tried to attack Andy, but he was ready for the attack and grabbed the monster's arm. The boy had a very confident look on his face. He asked the attacker who he was and how he knew the forbidden magic of the Boar Kingdom. The monster stopped and looked at the children. He turned around to run away, but Andy chased after him and told him there was no escape. Susie watched all of this and was very worried. She didn't understand what was happening, but she was sure it was dangerous. A crowd had already gathered behind the protagonist. Everyone had come to see the commotion. Juju asked the girl what was going on. Susie told her that Andy had chased the monster and was in danger. Ju called all these words nonsense and said that there was no place for monsters in the palace. She asked the guards to take the child away. The protagonist realized that they didn't believe her. Suddenly, the emperor appeared with the guards. Susie guessed that the emperor would not believe her either, but she was worried that something might happen to Andy. The ruler approached the girl and asked what she had seen. Jinuo noticed that Susie was very scared. He asked what kind of monster it was. The girl said that she thought it was among the entourage, however, it suddenly turned into a monster. She was very scared. Andy said that this monster was a puppet. Susie showed in which direction they ran away and asked the emperor to help save Andy. Hua Xing was angry looking at all this. The ruler ordered the guards to check everything and find Andy. The emperor sat at the table with Susie. The girl wondered how strong the monster was and if Andy would be okay. Ji Nuo replied that everything would be fine and told the little girl to rest. The protagonist headed to her room while the knights continued to discuss the monster puppet. That magic was from the Boar Kingdom and the guards found four kinds of magic power at the scene. Besides Prince Andy's power and the marionette's power, there was also a fireball. The emperor explained that the fireball most likely belonged to Susie. One of the knights said that there was something wrong here. He told them that Crown Prince Eugile had activated teleportation magic and would be here in person. On the way to her room, Susie met Andy. The girl was glad that he was all right, but he reacted strangely and asked not to touch him. He asked the main character where she got the bracelet from. It was a strange question because he had given it to her himself. The boy thought to himself that he could not give this bracelet to another person and told Susie that she was a thief and dared to steal his thing. Andy grabbed the main character by the arm. Susie screamed that he was making a scandal on purpose and she was worried for nothing so nothing would happen to him. Andy said that, of course, nothing would happen to him. As he left, he told Susie that he wasn't done with her yet. The protagonist was very annoyed by the boy's behavior and decided that she would not return this bracelet to him on principle. Walking further down the corridor, the protagonist came across the Prince of the Flower Kingdom, Zhao Ban. It was the queen's legitimate son. He grabbed Susie by the hair and asked where she came from. The girl immediately recognized him that he was the one who replaced her, the queen's child. Zhao asked again who she was. Susie tried to push away, but he grabbed the girl's arms and hair 
saying she had no right to talk to him like that. The boy pushed the main character and she fell to the floor. Susie was horrified that Zhao had hit her. She realized that this boy had stolen her mom and still dares to behave like this. The protagonist pushed back. The boy pushed her again. Susie left a bloody abrasion on the prince's face. The maids and Juju, who accused the protagonist of hurting the heir to the throne, ran to the noise. The woman was saying that Susie had committed a deadly crime and this ragamuffin must be captured. Juju, watching Susie being captured by the knights, smiled and chafed. The woman wished the girl dead and ordered her to be taken away, saying it was an order from His Majesty the King. Andy entered Ji Nuo's room. He told him that someone had appeared in the kingdom who possessed the magic of the Boar Kingdom. The boy suspected that there was a spy in the Flower Kingdom and that it might be an official of the Boer Kingdom accused of espionage. The emperor replied to Andy that he was right and the most important thing at the moment was to ensure safety. G promised to talk to the prince's father about the criminal. Andy was surprised that his father would come here. The ruler activated teleportation and the king of the Boer Kingdom, Andy's father, appeared out of a magical halo. He greeted Ji Nuo and said that they hadn't seen each other for a long time. This man was the first pretender to the throne, the crown prince of the Boer Kingdom, and his name was Yu Jail. The guest was worried that his son might have caused trouble. Andy, looking at his father, said that he was the one causing trouble because he still hadn't gotten the throne and his son was already wanted to be killed. The king's aide came and whispered something in his ear. In the meeting room, Zhu Rong was kneeling in front of the emperor. Next to her was Suzi and Zhao Ban. The girl said that she failed to take care of the prince and disappointed the king and queen. She said that Zhao Ban was injured and she deserved to die. The emperor asked what happened. Zhao said it was all the girl's fault and pointed his finger at Suzi, saying it was her fault because she scratched him with her fingernails. The protagonist replied that it was actually him who grabbed her hair. The prince told Susie that according to the laws of the Flower Kingdom, she should be condemned to death for attacking the prince. The boy promised that her head would soon fall off her shoulders and she shouldn't stand there and argue now. The protagonist replied that all she did was scratch his face and he was going to take her and kill her. Susie told Zhao that he didn't deserve to be the queen's child because Her Majesty had imprisoned herself in the God Tower for the blessing of the common people. The girl thought that the prince had no right to call himself the queen's child and perhaps he could become the ruler of the Flower Kingdom, but he would not get respect. Yu Jaile sat next to the emperor and watched everything that was going on. He said that this girl was not so simple and it seems that in the Flower Kingdom, not all women in the Flower Kingdom fall off their feet at the slightest breeze. The man said that if this girl had to die according to their laws, it was better to give her to him and let her become a resident of the Boar Kingdom. Everyone present was shocked by what Eugile said. Juju thought it was strange things and asked who he was. Andy's father wished for this girl to become his son's wife. The Flower Kingdom had always hoped to drag the Boar Kingdom into its allies. Uniting kingdoms into brother nations through the bonds of marriage is an extremely useful endeavor. If Susie were to mediate this union, she would become a statesman of the Flower Kingdom, and the incident of the prince's injury would be negated. The emperor irritably replied to his guest that there was no need to coddle his tongue, taking advantage of his personal favor. Yu Jail laughed. Everyone present was shocked that this man was the crown prince of the Boer Kingdom. Ji Nuo told his guest that he was only the crown prince and had miscalculated his strength. They were discussing Susie's life in her presence. The girl felt as if it had nothing to do with her. The girl realized that the law is on the side of the strongest. The protagonist realized that marrying into the Boer Kingdom was her only chance of survival. Andy was watching everything from the sidelines and was not willing to marry this thief. In his chambers, Jinuo was pondering about Susie. Yu Jail had once again told him about the marriage between kingdoms and thought that the emperor should be a little more serious. The guest said that he, as the heir, was still not the first person of the Boer Kingdom, but his father was already old and easily influenced by other people. The recent rebellion had affected many people, 
and Ujjayal was only worried about the children. The Boer Kingdom was in chaos at the moment. The state of power was shaky. The heir to the throne said that the rebellion did not subside even for a day, and so he could not bring them back to the kingdom. Ujjayal said that the only sure way to keep them in the Flower Kingdom for a long period of time was through marriage. If that person doesn't inherit the throne, it will probably stay like that. Ji Nuo asks his guest why he chose the commoner Suzy, since he has many other princesses. Yu Zhail realized that the ruler doesn't want to let her go. And all this time, the emperor was silent, so he wanted to save her. The ruler suggested changing the subject. Suzy rode in the carriage, and Hampton talked about how they would soon arrive at her family's estate. He talked about how something really strange had happened at the palace this time. Everyone around them was already saying that the protagonist would soon become the bride of the Boer Kingdom. The Emperor's aide was saying that this was happy news, and it would surely be announced to everyone soon. The man thought that everyone would be very happy. Andy and his bird hawk were wandering around town. At some point the boy realized he was lost. He thought he needed to go to the palace, but the hawk led him into some unfamiliar place. The protagonist got out of the carriage and took a deep breath of air. At some point, it seemed to her that something was going on behind her back, but turning around, she saw that there was nothing. The girl decided that she had imagined it. The whole vile family was happily greeting Susie, who said she had come home. Andy watched from the sidelines and realized where the bird had led him. The hawk was looking at his master with a look of settled life. Susie was walking down the hallway at night, holding a candle. Suddenly, that candle went out and someone behind her covered the girl's mouth with the palm of her hand. The main character turned around, saw Andy, and angrily asked the boy what he was doing, if he wanted to play a trick on her again, especially it was late at night. Suddenly, Susie's friend sat down, grabbing her shoulder. The protagonist realized that Andy was feeling this way because of the wound he had received when he had risked himself to save her. It was incomprehensible why he pretended indifference in front of strangers. Susie gently touched Andy's cape with her finger and asked if he was okay. The boy laughed and admitted that he must have overestimated himself. So he was a little shaken up, but that he was alive and well. In fact, Andy saw the secret magic of the Boar Kingdom in the Flower Kingdom. So he hurried to catch the man, Susie. He said that he didn't know about coming across the high-blooded monster. The boy confessed to Susie that he was very hungry and asked if she had anything to munch on. Susie brought a tray of sweets and Andy ate them. With his mouth full, Andy said he had to get back to the palace and asked Susie if she could contact his majesty or prepare the carriage. Susie advised her friend to eat more slowly and promised to ask the Baron if he could help him in this matter. Andy put his finger to the protagonist's lips and said that it was not allowed to tell the outsiders anything. The boy said he was not allowed to reveal his whereabouts and couldn't trust anyone but Susie. Near the room, someone's voice asked the protagonist who she was talking to. Avery burst into the room and asked his sister who the person next to her was. He accused his sister of bringing home a lover and threatened to tell everything. Andy covered the boy's mouth and affirmatively told him that he wouldn't tell anyone anything. Avery felt the same dark energy emanating from the stranger as he had once felt. He didn't understand when his sister had gotten involved with this dangerous man, and he thought the girl was a witch herself. Susie intervened and asked Andy not to touch her brother. The prince turned to the protagonist and said that he would get in trouble if he told everyone about his whereabouts, and the people in the Flower Kingdom don't know the concept of valor. Andy took Avery by the shoulders and said it was nothing personal, but he didn't want to screw up, and there could be dire consequences if anyone found out. Avery sat on the floor talking about how this man had frightening powers and asked if he was a demon. Suddenly, the youngest son of Vile got up off the floor and ran off in an unknown direction. Andy coughed up blood. Susie was very worried. Although the boy said he was fine, but his coughing was bloody. Prince admitted that he had used too much force to scare this kid, so he felt sick. Andy suggested that he'd caused the girl a lot of trouble and he'd better leave. So he jumped out the window. In his room, Avery was reading a book and thinking about his encounter with Andy. The boy decided that he had to tell his parents everything and ran to them. Opening the door, 
From the threshold, Avery shouted to his parents that Susie had brought home some unknown guy. Entering his parents' room, the boy saw that his father was sitting next to Susie and the stranger Andy, who winked at him mysteriously and said, Hi there. Last night when Andy had run away from Susie, she had yelled after him to stop and told him to believe that Baron Weil and Catherine were wonderful people. Prince decided to trust his friend. Prince introduced himself to the Baron and said his name was Andy No Shialiai. He asked Stefan to help him contact the royal palace as soon as possible. The head of the Vale family, upon hearing the boy's surname, realized that it was related to the Boer royal family, and this matter was really important. He promised that he would contact the palace right away and wrote a letter. Susie asked the prince how his wound was and said that they could get a healer to examine him. Andy replied that everything was fine and the injury was due to forbidden magic and a regular healer wouldn't be able to deal with it. But not to worry because as soon as he got back to his majesty's palace, Ji Nuo would be able to help. Arnold and his dog entered the living room and asked his sister who this stranger was. The brother was worried that he might have displeased Susie. The main character reassured her brother and said that everything was fine and that this was her good friend. The boys shook hands. Arnold was worried that Susie wouldn't need him now. Baron Weil told the prince that he had heard that he had been injured to save his daughter. Stefan was very happy that Susie had found a good friend like Andy. After hearing the words of praise, the prince asked the Baron if he would be willing for Susie to go to the Boer Kingdom with him. The man clearly didn't expect such a question. The Vile family's eldest son, Murel, returned home. He brought boxes of gifts for Catherine's mother and for his brothers. The main character rejoiced at her brother's return. Morel took Susie in his arms. The girl asked her brother why he came back so early, because in Dr. David's letter, it was written that he had to stay with him for another half a month. Murel stroked his sister's hair and wanted to say something, but suddenly Andy appeared and greeted the eldest son of the Weil family. Murel was sitting in the living room talking to Susie, who asked him how Dr. David was doing. In the back sat Andy. The older brother was telling the protagonist that Dr. David was doing well, and he kept praising her and couldn't get excited about the protagonist's idea of compulsory education. The older brother confessed that his teacher had asked him to help the emperor pass a decree on universal education at the assembly. David was eager to start building schools in all the towns. It had been so long, and the decree had not yet been passed. Susie rejoiced and said that if the decree was passed, everyone in the kingdom would be able to get an education, and Dr. David was working a great miracle. She was sure that all the people of the Flower Kingdom would be grateful. The prince overheard the conversation and remained silent. Andy looked at Susie and realized that he had never seen her like this before. In the beginning, the hawk thought she was just beautiful. The boy thought so too. And then, when he saw her unconscious, a desire to protect the girl unconsciously rose in him. The prince thought she was just an ordinary girl, a child. Andy hadn't expected her to discuss such serious topics with her adult brother that even the prince couldn't bring up. He didn't know what Susie and Murel were talking about. The lust for possession in the prince only grew stronger. The heroine turned to Andy and proposed the idea of basic education in the kingdom of Boar. The prince had a hard time understanding what his friend was talking about. Murel asked Andy what his grades were and assumed that he was excellent in all subjects. Avery assumed the boy was illiterate. Arnold thought his little brother was talking about him and got upset. Murel patted Arnold on the head and said that as soon as the schools were completed, he could get an education. Susie decided to introduce and introduce her older brother Andy. The protagonist said that he was a friend she had met at the palace and he had come to her for help. Mural interrogated whether someone had offended Susie at the palace. The girl replied that it was just a simple misunderstanding and not worth worrying about. The older brother stroked his sister's head and apologized for what she had to go through. Avery told Morel that Andy was obviously a bad person and had dark magic energy coming from him, and last time the same energy had come from Susie. The boy was sure that these two were obviously hiding some dark deeds. Andy turned to Avery and said that he had been telling him all sorts of nasty things since yesterday. The principal explained that the dark energy was because he had been attacked 
not because he was some kind of dark sorcerer. Andy revealed that he had received an invitation from the Flower Kingdom and had left Boar. Merle confirmed that he had heard that the Boar Kingdom was troubled right now, and this situation had been going on for months. Mural said that the Emperor of the Flower Kingdom wanted to help Crown Prince Eugale quell the rebellion to restore friendly relations between the two kingdoms. Andy didn't understand how the guy knew all this. Intelligence magic could give information about an object, and there was no danger behind it. Avery blurted out about this type of magic. Mural asked not to worry and said it was High Priest Nickens. In the Flower Kingdom, this was the only person who could affect such a large area with magic. The priest introduced himself to the prince and said that they could return to the palace. At the Vile family's estate, Prince Andy and the priest boarded the carriage. The baron and his family escorted him out. Susie hoped Andy would be all right and asked him to take care of himself. As the prince and Nickens got into the carriage, the boy coughed violently and said that he should have kept his face in front of the lady since he was a man. The priest replied that he was a good runner and they could find him here after spending all day, and that only after they had heard from him. Andy said that wasn't something to brag about. Nickens asked if Andy knew the owners of the estate. He thought he saw a toddler with tremendous powers of magic. Mural and Susie were sitting in the living room. The guy was talking about how there was actually another important reason for his arrival. The Kingdom of Boar had expressed a desire to marry into the Vale bloodline and the crown prince had chosen the suitor himself. Mural announced that they had chosen Susie. The protagonist blushed and her brother realized it was true. He told the girl about a lot of things that had happened in the palace. Susie replied that she didn't know why they had suggested such a thing. Mural said that the girl had been through a lot of terrible events and must have been scared and reached out to the girl. The sister replied that everything is fine now because she is at home. Mural said that he did not know why the Crown Prince chose Susie, but his desire is clear. They want to get the help of the Flower Kingdom to quell the rebellion and bring peace to their lands. Besides, the marriage will be an outlet for the people who are tired of conflict. Her brother told Susie that it was beneficial to the kingdom, but he was worried about his sister and asked if she could leave home and go to a foreign kingdom. Marry someone she doesn't know at all and become a sacrifice for the political benefit of the kingdom. Mural said that Susie is not the king's child, and they would probably still be discussing the matter. Besides, the king has the six princesses. The brother decided that he should pay a visit to his majesty and give up this obscene position. The main character was very afraid for her brother and told him that it was dangerous and he should not do that. The girl said that it was a shame that she would not be able to control her life on her own, but she did not mind this turn of events. Susie realized that her brother was not aware that perhaps only by leaving the Flower Kingdom could she get a chance to survive. Otherwise, after her identity is declassified, she will be killed. Mural asked if Andy would be her consort. The girl didn't know, for Crown Prince Uzael didn't say who it would be. Mural assumed that his sister didn't mind because there was a possibility that her consort would be Andy. Susie blushed and yelled that she strongly disagreed. It made her angry that her little brother thought that. The girl was convinced that Andy was too small. In the royal palace of Boar, Ujile talked to his son and told him about the upcoming marriage. The boy didn't understand why he had to marry the princess of the Flower Kingdom. He couldn't believe that their kingdom had descended to such a state. The boy reminded his father that he had said that the men of their lineage should be great. He didn't understand why being a prince should sell his body. Ujile asked Andy to come to his senses. His father explained to Andy that he had been cursed with puppet magic and such people could do anything, so he had to move them to the Flower Kingdom until things calmed down in the Boar Kingdom. Andy replied that they had made that decision behind his back. His brother Awen could have gotten married instead. Eugel replied that the decision hasn't been made yet as to who exactly should get married. There is a secret in the kingdom of Boar that no one knows. Prince Eugel's successors are actually identical twins. Awen told his brother that he is not the successor, so it is up to his older brother to marry. Andy said he was born before his brother by only a minute. At birth, a curse appeared around their bodies. There were eyes lurking everywhere in the dangerous royal chambers that wanted to take their lives. 
To prevent the intruders from guessing that you lived, both princes had to live the life of one person. Ujjayale was outraged and said that his sons had turned such an important matter into some kind of buffoonery. The man talked about how His Majesty Ji Nuo had already agreed to his proposal and would soon announce it to the world, and it was an important diplomatic event. Ujjayale spoke to his sons that as princes, they have a duty to fulfill. Andy said that he doesn't care and would rather die, but he won't marry the princess of the Flower Kingdom. Ji Nuo was in the throne room, welcoming the vile family. The sender announced to the Baron that in the time of the former king, their family held a high position, and even though they were currently in exile, they still had noble blood flowing in their veins. The Emperor explained that he had summoned them today to inform them of an important matter. Susie had gained the favor of the Crown Prince of the Boar Kingdom, Ujjayal, and it had been decided that she would marry his son and become a princess of the Boar Kingdom. Stefan and Catherine were shocked by what they heard. The Baron wanted to object, but Susie took his hand and told him it was okay. The Emperor said that Susie was still too young to go to a foreign kingdom that was 1,000 versts away. Ji Nuo looked at the protagonist carefully and remembered all the moments he spent by the girl's side. The Emperor told the Weil family that if they didn't agree, he could refuse the Crown Prince's wish. Here came this day that it was impossible not to dread. Susie had to ponder if the benefit of being married in distant lands. Although the number of contacts with the Emperor of the Flower Kingdom was inevitably increasing, but the danger was also increasing. The protagonist realized that if she could actually get married in the Boar Kingdom and leave this place, she would finally get out of this quagmire, and then everything would change, and the future where the girl dies would never take place. Susie replied to the Emperor that she agreed to marry and leave for the Boar Kingdom to be the guarantor of peace in the two kingdoms. Ji Nuo was silent in response and stared at the girl intently. People in the kingdom were whispering that the Emperor wanted to bestow the title on the new princess. There were rumors that everything was happening because of the alliance marriage with the Boar Kingdom. The people thought it would be a great boon to have this union as a support for the Flower Kingdom. Stefan sat in his room, holding his head with his hand, and didn't understand how this had happened, for if Susie was granted the title of princess, she would have to enter the palace and live there. The Baron realized that he would miss her, but most importantly, it could be too dangerous in the palace, for her identity could be revealed. Hiding the truth from the king is a terrible sin. Susie entered the Baron's house and said she wanted to speak to him. The girl realized that her father was worried about her having to leave for the Far Kingdom, and perhaps he was worried because of her knowledge of etiquette. The protagonist admitted that she too worried about making a mistake or failing in her duties in the Kingdom of Boar, but to abandon her duty for fear of doing the wrong thing would be wrong. Susie had told her father that she wanted to be the best, even though she knew that her father and mother wished her a safe and prosperous life but she wanted to become someone that she and her mother could be proud of. Stefan looked at Susie and didn't realize when she had time to turn into a grown-up girl and grow up like that. The man realized that she couldn't hide all her life and her mother the queen would also want her daughter to live happily and safely. The Baron felt that he had to try and deal with the hardships with dignity. He hoped that someday he could find justice for the queen's sake and for Princess Susie's sake. Susie hugged Stefan and decided to confess that she had, in fact, disrupted the order of the palace last time. The girl revealed that it was Crown Prince Ugale who had saved her. It seemed to Susie that he liked her and would not hurt her. The protagonist was given the title of Princess Susie and announced that when she came of age, she would marry and go to the Kingdom of Boar. The Emperor crowned the girl. The people believed that Princess Susie would grant the kingdom an entire century of peace and prosperity. According to the original plot, after the title ceremony, Princess Susie, who is betrothed for the sake of the country, was supposed to meet the son of the Crown Prince of the Kingdom of Boar at the ceremony, and then the engagement was to be announced. The ceremony didn't start for some reason. The people didn't understand what everyone was waiting for. Everyone was looking for the prince. A grand scandal started when people found out that Crown Prince Boar's son had suddenly run away. 
it slowly became apparent that the prince had escaped from under the crown prince. People whispered about what had happened. The main character felt oppressed. The girl's gaze became desolate. In the far reaches of the royal palace, Andy tried to climb over the fence and asked Avon to help for a reward. The prince thought no one would want to marry that stupid princess. Ewan looked at his brother through the bars of the fence and thought him a true fool, for he did not even know who the bride was, but he was running away. He wondered if Andy would go crazy if he married this girl, for she was quite interesting. Rumors spread that the prince had escaped from the wine and the Boar Kingdom was breaking the arrangement. Normally, Prince Andy is quite peaceful, who knew he was so determined. It was obvious that a descendant of the Sialii family couldn't marry some commoner. Everyone knew that the bride was personally chosen by Crown Prince Eugale. His Majesty's reputation was damaged. People were wondering how it would all end. The main character was sad about Andy. Susie wanted to believe that he did not hate her, however, in the form of a marriage partner she was not to his liking. The girl realized that she would have to become dirt in the royal palace. The protagonist could not free herself and did not know what to do. The emperor appeared. Susie was furious. The girl bowed before the ruler. He at that moment took her in his arms and menacingly called Eugel, demanding an explanation of where Andy was now. The emperor perceived this situation as their clan looking down on the flower kingdom. Eugel came in. He said that there had been a mistake. His son had suddenly contracted an illness and would not be able to attend the ceremony. Susie looked questioningly at the emperor and couldn't believe that he was protecting her. The protagonist felt safe in the arms of the emperor and her father. Eugail asked if Susie was angry and tried to take the girl in his arms, but she only pressed herself harder against the emperor. Genuo told the crown prince that if he didn't resolve the issue, no one would bring his son. Andy was even searched for in the countryside vacation palace of Ujaila. The crown prince was furious that his son was still missing. He believed that the nasty little boy had decided to drive him to his death. The man decided that it would be possible to replace Andy Ewan so as not to waste time. The servant said that both brothers were missing. Eugale was angry and asked to find these ungenerous offspring. Servants from all over the manor searched for the princes. Ewan lay on the roof and twirled the stealth ring in his hands, thinking that it was a very useful item. The boy had decided that if he married the princess, his brother would stop talking to him. In his, in his study, the emperor was having tea with Susie and Eugel. He was talking about how the crown prince couldn't even find his son and subjected them to a great humiliation. It was very strange that a prince who should marry for the sake of the union of countries suddenly escaped from under the crown prince's crown. Eugel replied that the emperor could just ignore that damn son, and once they exchanged credentials, Susie would be considered his daughter-in-law. Ji Nuo realized that the crown prince wanted to deprive his daughter of a formal ceremony and marry her off to his son anyhow. The emperor talked about how it was just an engagement and suggested that they could also humiliate the girl like this during the wedding. Jinuo expressed his assumptions to the crown prince in a rude tone that when Susie goes far away to the Boar Kingdom, they would abuse her because the ruler wouldn't know about it. Yujaile made excuses and talked about force majeure. He swore that men of his kind would not abuse women. The emperor replied that the engagement couldn't take place like that anyway. Jinuo offered to talk about it when Andy would obediently accept his duty. Yujaile said that she would be returning to her kingdom soon and they wouldn't have time. But the emperor was adamant and said it was out of the question. The protagonist didn't understand why the ruler pretended as if he didn't care very much. It was just a political marriage after all. There's nothing wrong with making an engagement through the exchange of letters of marriages because the main goal in all of this is to get the protection of the Boar Kingdom. The protagonist was trying to understand why the emperor was so resentful, but she was sure that she must be wrong because he could not be such an attentive person. In the main heroine's chambers, the maids were dressing the girl. She had many dresses and all of them were engagement gifts from the kingdom of Boar. There were also gifts from his majesty, the emperor. One of the maids was telling Susie that her highness was now the emperor's seventh princess. And from today, she would be residing in the palace. And from tomorrow, they would start teaching her court etiquette. The seventh princess, the wife of Earl Miller, 
and etiquette came to the protagonist. Susie was offered to first learn the etiquette for greeting with the emperor. The girl showed how to properly sit down and greet the king. When Susie greeted Jinuo so formally, he asked the girl to socialize with him without formality. The emperor wanted Susie to meet Lady Juruo and her daughter, with whom they were the same age. He wanted the children to play together. Ji Nuo's harem is quite small. All the states are aware that he has no pity for women and is completely indifferent to female beauty. Apart from the queen, there were only a few consorts in the palace who should be kept in mind for duty. Now that the queen has been dwelling in the Tower of God for a long time, there are only two women left of the entire harem, and one of them is Lady Juju. The emperor had said that the palace had enough female teachers and even had an entire education class. He was sure that another child for a girl would not be an impossible task. The palace was strict about the seniority of titles, but any child needed a mother, so the emperor asked to fulfill the role of a mother for Susie. Lady Ju bowed and said she would obey. In her thoughts, the girl was angry that His Majesty had called her to a private meeting just to discuss this. The girl didn't understand why she had to fulfill the role of a mother and thought it was all some kind of nonsense. She wanted to know what was wrong with this girl. Ju assumed it was all because of the union of the two kingdoms. Ji Nuo announced to the protagonist that Lady Ju would now be her mother in the palace and grabbed the girl's cheek. Watching all this, the concubine didn't understand how this commoner and ordinary little girl was able to gain the emperor's favor. Lady Ju Ju called Susie the seventh princess and said that if the little girl needed anything, she could contact her and consider her as her mother. The protagonist realized that this girl used to be cruel and wanted to kill her out of hatred. Ju brought the protagonist to her daughter Hua Xing's room and announced that this was now her new friend by the will of the emperor. The girl asked the children to behave well and become friends. Hua asked the main character if she would play with her. Susie replied that she was the new girl, the seventh princess, titled by his majesty's order. The king said that from now on, she would live together with Lady Juju. Susie realized that Hua Xing didn't recognize her after that incident at the event because they were wearing masquerade masks. The girl asked Susie to be best friends from now on, and even though she was the seventh princess, so she was younger. But Ju's daughter wanted to remain a little sister. Hua Xing offered the protagonist to live with her and said she could borrow her room. She promised to give Susie everything because she probably hadn't seen such beautiful dresses before. The main character said that she had her own room, and Lady Miller said that it was not appropriate for a princess to use other people's space as well as things, so she should not agree to this offer. Hua Xing asked who Lydia Miller was and said that she couldn't be more important than her best friend. The girl's eyes filled with tears and she assumed that she didn't like Susie anymore. Because of the spoiled Hua Xing's pleas, Lady Miller gave in and let Susie live in her chambers, hoping that it would favor their relationship. But Ju's daughter, who had paid lip service to the fact that she would give up her room, made the girl sleep directly on the servant's crib. Hua Xing asked Susie how she was sleeping, whether she was used to it. The girl said she didn't like it and preferred the big soft crib. The princess liked to fall asleep talking to each other. The main character was thinking in her head that she just doesn't want to get to know each other intimately yet. Hua Xing's ball fell out of her hands. She got upset and asked her sister to help pick it up. Susie didn't understand why she had to play glass ball with the girl the moment she wanted to sleep. Regardless, Susie got up, picked up the balloon, and handed it to her new friend. The protagonist realized that Hua Xing seemed to see her as a servant. Susie didn't see this as a problem, after all. She had just entered the palace, and it wasn't worth starting a scandal. The next day, Susie woke up, got out of bed, looked around, and for a second she thought that this pretender would really give all these things away. A huge number of maids appeared nearby, who wanted to help the girl. Although Hua Xing had promised Susie that she would give up her closet, the maids only dared to give away the things that the princess didn't like. The protagonist knew it would be like this, but she didn't care about the situation. Hua Xing called Susie to play in the backyard, calling her to come with her. The girls came to the garden. Daughter Ju slapped herself on the cheek and cried. At that moment, 
the emperor and his knights were passing by. Hearing that the princess was crying, he approached the girls. Jinuo wanted to know what was going on. Hua Xing was crying and said she wasn't doing it on purpose but because she was in pain. Suzy just kept quiet. Ten minutes ago, the girls were playing merrily, but Hua Xing dropped her glass ball again, but this time into the river. The princess ordered the main character to pick it up. Suzy replied that she couldn't pick it up because it had fallen into the river and it was very dangerous. Hua Xing was angry and said that Suzy had always picked up the balloon when it fell. The girl replied that she couldn't this time or it might turn into trouble. The princess said that she needed that balloon and in an orderly tone told Susie to pick it up. The main character was angry that this little girl was throwing a tantrum for no reason. Susie was about to just walk away, but Hua Xing grabbed the girl by the hair and ordered her to pick up her balloon. The emperor asked the protagonist why she was silent. He couldn't wait to find out what happened. Hua Xing approached the emperor and said she was in pain. Jinuo told him to take the girl to the manor and apply medicine all over her face. The protagonist trembled at the sight of the ruler's fierce gaze. The emperor stroked Susie's head and told her that she couldn't do any good for herself if she kept silent. He noticed that the girl was not making excuses and asked if she was afraid she would be punished. The emperor was surprised that the girl really didn't want to explain anything. He said that a man should fight to the end for his own interests. Susie looked back questioningly. Jinuo told the girl that she was so confused now and how she was going to survive in the court of the Boer Kingdom. The emperor didn't want the girl to ignore how she was being hurt and humiliated, but she asked if her explanation really wanted to be listened to. Jinuo replied that he was not blind. Besides, her father was always willing to listen to his daughter's opinion, and she could tell him anything and ask for a favor. The ruler of the kingdom held Susie tightly to him, and the girl cried. Tears are an effective tool for gaining sympathy. The emperor wiped the girl's tears from her face and said that they were useful, but she could only cry in front of her father and shouldn't think that weakness would solve all her problems. Ji Nuo told the girl that in front of strangers, one must show fortitude and bravery. One cannot play by the rules, but one must not allow oneself to be offended by others. Otherwise, he would not be able to let her go to the kingdom of Bor with a calm heart. The protagonist pondered that the emperor only treats her with affection because of the family ties between them. But it's impossible not to get attached to your father when he's like this. The man cared a great deal for Susie. The girl thought it would be great if she hadn't read the history of the Flower Kingdom and didn't know the whole truth. Susie wanted to accept his love, even if it was self-deception, even if it was a path to nowhere. The protagonist's musings were interrupted by Hua Xing, who accused Susie of hurting her and still having the conscience to get caught. The princess asked what kind of punishment her father had in mind for her. Hua Xing said that she had been dared to hit her and would never forgive her for it. The girl told the protagonist not to even think about sleeping in the same chambers with her and dashingly slammed the door shut. The heroine wandered around the manor for a long time and came across some gloomy place. There was a huge wooden gate. Susie knew that in the emperor's harem, there were always such rumors that these gates hid terrible secrets behind them. Ji Nuo has children from different concubines, but only two of them live in the court. The rest have fallen through the ground. Susie wanted to open this gate, but Miss Miller appeared from behind and told her that access to this place is strictly forbidden. The woman took the protagonist by the hand, but Susie did not leave questions about what hides this gate and why it is impossible to enter. Miss Miller led the protagonist to her room and told her that it was getting late and instead of wandering around idly, it was better to go to bed. The woman stood at the window, waiting for the girl to fall asleep. Even as Susie fell asleep, she thought about those gates and the secrets they held. She wanted to understand who the emperor is really an affectionate father or a bloodthirsty demon. The next day, Susie was running around the palace and could not find the very place with the gate, although she had been there only yesterday. The girl wanted to know what the gate was and what was behind it. Suddenly, Andy appeared. The boy told her that he thought the breaking of the engagement would make Susie happy. He asked if the girl still wanted to marry him. The protagonist replied that it was naive of him to even suggest such a thing, 
and that this marriage was a decision of two states or common benefit, and the girl's opinion was not taken into account. Susie did not understand why Andy had changed so drastically, whether their men were so fickle. The boy assumed that his girlfriend did not care who to marry, and the protagonist confirmed that she did. Andy said that Susie never ceased to amaze him, and she thought he looked pathetic. Suddenly, Hua Xing appeared, and she was very upset to see the two of them together. The girl asked why they were together. The princess told Susie that she hit her yesterday, and now she's playing with others and ignoring her. The main character replied that it was time to end the scandal. Andy leaned over and told Susie that he now realized that she was being bullied here, and that's why she wanted to get married soon and get out of here. The protagonist didn't understand why the boy was saying all this. Andy said that if asked nicely, he would, so be it, consider granting her wish. Left unheeded, Hua Xing simply walked away. In her room, Lady Zhu Zhu was trying to find the pearl. It is a reward that His Majesty gives personally. The woman shouted to the maids that it was a serious offense to lose this award. The concubine was sure that she had seen the pearl somewhere. The daughter was watching and remembered dropping her glass ball, the pearl, into the river. Zhu Rong asked her daughter if she had picked up the pearl. The girl replied that it was Susie and she had lost it. A few minutes later, two girls were asked where the pearl was. Susie said she hadn't lost anything and didn't even know what it was. The emperor's concubine said that none of this matters, and now the taper of truth will investigate and tell which one of them is telling the truth. It is a summoned magical beast that feeds on dreams while remaining harmless to humans. While this creature gnaws at humans, no secret can be hidden from it. The protagonist remembered that this was the same nasty beast that her brother Morel had told her about, and if it gnawed into her, everyone would know the truth about her identity. This could not be allowed to happen. Susie made the decision to run away. Juju told the maids to hold the girl. Hua Xing didn't expect this turn of events either, but no one could catch the protagonist. She ran to the very gate that beckoned her with its mysteries. The gate opened and Susie fell to the floor. The girl remembered that access to this place is strictly forbidden. When the gate opened, the protagonist saw on the walls a huge number of portraits of different people. Also in this room stood the emperor, who said that no one had come here for a long time. Susie apologized and said that not on purpose disturbed him. The girl said that she was caught up and she frightened and ran in here. Now it was clear what lurked behind this gate, a place inaccessible to any living soul except Jinuo himself. Susie speculated that the emperor might have created this room to honor previous rulers. Perhaps all these people in the portraits were his relatives. There was so much sadness in the ruler's eyes, and this place, it was like it was soaked in loneliness. Jinuo assumed that the girl had run into trouble. Susie said that she was accused of taking the pearl, but it wasn't true. Next to the emperor, the girl felt much calmer. Susie said that she was not lying, and everyone knew that the emperor had personally granted the pearl to Mrs. Juju, and even if it was really Susie, it would be impossible to use it without being noticed, except to hide it somewhere. The girl said that she was very young and this pearl was of no use at all. The emperor suggested that the princess might have gotten curious and wanted to play with the pearl. Susie said that pretty pacifiers didn't pique her interest in the slightest. The emperor looked at the main character and said that she was very similar to her and just as sharp of tongue. Ji Nuo was referring to one of the past rulers, his sister predecessor. It was the 13th ruler of the Flower Kingdom, Emily Nor, and the girl had read about her in the history of the Flower Kingdom. The girl said she didn't want to be like Emily because he didn't like her. Susie said there are no strangers in this room and only he appears before them in silence. There were handprints on the frame of this portrait, suggesting that the emperor could not resist touching it while he was reminiscing. Susie noticed that Emily's portrait hung in a conspicuous place but was covered in an even layer of dust. The emperor didn't even linger at her portrait, which meant she really was a pest. The emperor asked the girl if she thought he was disgusted by people like that. The protagonist felt that, in fact, the emperor was a very affectionate person by nature. Susie took Jinuo's hand and said that she would keep his secret and would not tell anyone anything, because there are such people in her life too. 
The emperor reminded the girl that earlier she had talked about wanting to go to school. Susie clarified if he would give his consent for her to start studying. Ji Nuo said that there was no point in studying outside, so Susie would study at the palace. Just like the protagonist herself said, cute pacifiers are really not interesting at all. So the emperor asked the girl to study well and try not to get into trouble every day. A month passed. The royal school did not divide the students into permanent classes, allowing them to choose the necessary subjects on their own. There were both small and large study groups, but the best students were given the opportunity to study with the most outstanding teachers. The royal school originally educated the science of the royal family and its inner circle. Since the council passed the education for all bill put forward by Professor David, secular schools have been established everywhere. Children recommended by someone in high places are educated together in the royal school. Among other things, all educational institutions in the country were created in the image of this very school. Along with Susie, Zhao Ban was also studying there. It was rumored that the emperor had finally approved the order to increase the student enrollment just because Zhao liked the lively atmosphere. Dr. David thought that no matter how it was, it was still a grand event. He said that from now on, even commoners would have the opportunity to study with the royal family's scions. In the entire continent, only the Flower Kingdom paid such attention to secular education. Lady Juju was sitting in the courtyard at the dining table. Her daughter was crying and saying that she wanted a doll and didn't want to go to school and walk there with a crowd of strangers. Her mother told her daughter that the council had passed the law on compulsory education. All children must now receive compulsory education, especially children from noble families. The servant told her that Princess Hua Xing had visited one of the schools and did not like it at all. Zhu Ruo explained that she was aware of the current state of affairs, but it was unclear why the ruler had suddenly made such a decision. Jin Wo had never liked women with education and their involvement in politics. Sitting next to the concubine was Madame Christina Luan. The girl was talking about how this could be an opportunity. Hua Xing at this moment was clutching her toy and repeating the word, die. The emperor was walking with an aide and asked if all seven princesses had started training. Hampton reminded him that the ruler had never liked the idea of education for women and had heard in the palace that only the eldest, the fourth princess, was talented, studying the canons, and the other princesses were only thinking about becoming ladies. The aide told the emperor that he had changed a lot. Ji Nuo told the guy to shut up. A man approached and asked permission to ask a question of a personal nature. One of the servants had heard that Professor David was going to personally teach at the royal school, and the man wanted his two worthless offspring to be so fortunate to be able to study at this institution. Another servant said that his son was turning eight years old this year and fit the age limit. Everyone talked about their child because everyone wanted their children to have the opportunity to attend the king's school. Hampton told Susie about it. The girl was surprised that the king had agreed to accept the children of all these nobles into the royal school. It was a wonder when he had time to become so accommodating. The emperor's aide replied to the protagonist that everything would depend on the results of the single selection of students. Susie was glad that her brothers would also have the opportunity to study in the same school as her. She wanted to share this information with her big brother as soon as possible. Susie wrote a letter in which she asked Arnold and Avery to be ready to take the royal exams. In the letter, the girl explained that if they passed the selection, they would study with her. Mural assumed that the girl was very lonely in the palace, and if one of them went to take care of her, it would be perfect. Naturally, Arnold volunteered to be the first to participate in the selection. Avery had said that if his middle brother passed, this school would be the end. Morel looked out the window and wondered what was going on with Susie, and the girl was thinking about him at that moment. The younger brothers were bullying each other at this point. Finally, the protagonist managed to get into the royal school. Studying there was a little like what the girl had to experience in her past life, but in this life, she must control her own fate. Susie pondered whether her brothers would be able to come. The main character studied so hard that she periodically skipped meals and even sleep. In this world, the stronger your magic, the more respect you get from those around you. In the Flower Kingdom, due to prejudice, 
it is believed that all warlocks are male. There were no women among the local heroic figures, and to ensure a safe, quiet life, you have to deal with the prejudices of the emperor. Susie realized that she was about to become better and stronger, and Jinuo would sigh and regretfully think of her, and how sorry he was that she wasn't his daughter. The girl did not realize whether in such a case this sword of Damocles would disappear, this threat that hangs over her since her arrival in this world. The protagonist stood at the blackboard reciting a complex spell, but told that this spell was invented by Duravi in the middle of the last century. In an aquatic environment, it helped control the flow of liquid. Susie's many years of modern schooling had come in handy greatly in her current studies. David praised the girl and said that she was learning the spell extremely fast. The scientist was shocked by the girl's exceptional talent. Susie memorized faster than the average student. For complex spells, she used various memorization techniques and coped well with it. After a successful answer, the main character was told to return to her seat and continue the lesson. The girls in Susie's class thought she was just lucky to learn the one thing she needed. They disliked the main heroine. Still, everyone knew that she was the new seventh princess that the king had taken in recently. Envious classmates thought that Susie pretends to be an aristocrat, considered it cheesy. But in any case, for these girls, the protagonist in no comparison with their real princess, with the fourth princess, Victoria, Susie and her classmates were attacked by a flock of crows. The children weren't sure if it was a drill. It seemed that these crows were really going to massacre them. Susie, carefully observing, explained to everyone that this was ruled out, and the scarlet mark in the eyes of these crows restrained them and would not allow them to harm people. This was the test their teacher had prepared for them. The protagonist felt that they should calm down and use the summoning technique. Only by summoning powerful beings was it possible to protect themselves and disperse the crows. One of her classmates was watching Susie closely, unable to believe that she was only six years old. The girl didn't look the least bit scared. Fourth Queen Victoria summoned a divine peacock with magic. The children hugged each other and rejoiced that they were saved. Their savior was Princess Victoria. An extremely gifted child was born in the royal palace. Her body was full of spiritual power. Her magic skills were simply amazing. Even as a young girl, she had won the praise and approval of the people and was on par with personalities like Crown Prince Zhao Ban himself. That's how Princess Victoria was. She had inherited Jinuo's beauty and coldness and was also known as the female copy of the Crown Prince. Classmates marveled at how the princess managed something so incredible and stunning. Next to the fourth princess, the children felt insignificant and asked her to teach them. The classmates wanted to become at least a tenth as strong as Victoria. Many were afraid to approach her, knowing whose daughter she was. While the crowd of amazed children were admiring Princess Victoria, Susie called on the phoenix, which dispersed all the crows. Now the girls were admiring Susie too, saying how strong she was and how wonderful it was that there were such talents among the students from lowly families. One of the girls said that the main character had the blood of a commoner in her, so she was giving them confidence and faith that everything would work out. Susie was stressed by these conversations about her life and asked them to stop discussing her during her studies and classes. Princess Victoria watched from the sidelines as Susie became popular. Classmates discussed that the fake princess had acquired minions. In the self-study class, one of the girls put her notebook on the desk and wanted to sit down. Her classmates came up to her and told her that she was taking the fourth princess's seat and pushed her to the floor. Susie came into the classroom and noticed what was wrong. She sat down in her seat, and one of Princess Victoria's friends came up behind her and pushed the girl, saying her legs weren't holding up. Then she threw all the books and notebooks off the main character's desk, saying she was sorry she was such a stretch. Susie crouched down to pick up her school supplies from the floor. The children around her laughed and said that now she would know her place. With disappointment, the main character realized that it was all over again, and after all these years, she was being bullied at school again. It seems that these kids wanted to get rid of the girl. Classmates tried to do Susie as many nasty things as possible. This time, they wrote on her textbook. Zhao Ban was watching around the corner. His friend wondered if he would help the girl, but the prince clearly had no intention of doing so. 
The classmates threw the protagonist's briefcase out the window and continued to make fun of her. Susie reflected on the words of a wise man who said that when confronted with jeering, instead of wasting time arguing with the offender, it was better to get away from him. Sometimes Susie wanted to fight back, but she didn't want the emperor to know what was going on so as not to inconvenience him. The protagonist was walking through the territory of the royal school and saw the palace guards practicing. As it turned out, Arnold, the protagonist's brother, was marching among the guards. Susie said hello to him. He waved back at her, but the commander tapped him on the head and told him not to be distracted during the lesson. When Arnold got free, he ran up to his sister. They hugged each other tightly, the boy telling her how much he missed her. The brother wondered to Susie if the new uniform suited him. The sister was curious to know how he got into the palace guard. The boy shared with the protagonist that Morel had told him and Avery to take part in the selection exam, and if they passed it, they could study with Susie. Except Arnold failed the written exam completely and didn't pass. The main character comforted her brother and said that the royal guard is also good, and in the end, he still ended up with his sister. Arnold called himself a dumbass that no one wants to spend time with. Susie smiled and told her brother that he was the best and would be the best palace guard ever. The girl wondered what about Avery. Her brother replied that the younger one probably failed even the interview, let alone the exam. Arnold asked to tell Susie how she was doing. At this point, the girl became sad and realized that her brother shouldn't know or care about her bullying. She would deal with that issue on her own. Susie replied that everything was going very well and she was being fattened up here. Princess Victoria and her friend happened to be nearby and noticed their classmate Susie sitting on a bench with someone and asked if she was friends with a palace guard. Arnold asked his sister if she knew these girls. Susie told him not to worry because they are her classmates and they have a case. The protagonist advised her brother to get back in line because the commander is probably looking for him and asked him to wait for her after class. The protagonist approached her abusers and one of them squeezed the girl's shoulder tightly to the point of pain. Susie realized that she needed to get them away from Arnold and shouldn't give him any reason to worry. The offending girl asked the protagonist if she would teach her a lesson using her magic. In the flower kingdom to change magic on ordinary people is allowed only in case of mortal danger and otherwise a reprimand from the magical association the punishment can go all the way to imprisonment. Princess Victoria joined Susie in the conversation and asked if she thought her magic was so strong that she could fight back. The princess suggested a duel to determine who was the strongest mage. The protagonist told Victoria that if she didn't use her sneaky tricks, she was ready for a duel at any time of the day or night. Her rival replied to Susie that she was finished. He retorted that only the winner had the right to say that and reminded her that her technique had been better than Victoria's that time in class. The protagonist said she could repeat it many times, and victory would be hers. No matter how many challenges Victoria gave, the result would always be the same. At that moment, the fourth princess slapped the protagonist on the cheek. Arnold saw this. His brother walked over and punched Princess Victoria back for his sister. He asked if Susie was okay, and said that he couldn't let anyone hurt her. The sister asked Arnold to get out of there as soon as possible. The fourth princess called the guards and told them to grab Susie and her brother. She threatened to scatter them all in the dungeons. Arnold told Victoria that it was only a slap and she had no right to hurt his sister. Susie's brother put a boot on the fourth princess's head. She was furious. The guards captured Arnold with the main character. Andy arrived at the vile family's estate. He reflected on the fact that he was chased from the palace itself and there was no way to get away from these guys. He realized he'd lost a lot of time, but he'd finally found what he was looking for. Andy saw Avery walking down the street and ran up to him to tell him that they had met again. The Baron's youngest son asked the prince what he was doing here. Andy explained that he had come to find Susie. He asked Avery to help him, promising to just take one look at the girl and leave. While wondered if the prince didn't know where the protagonist was, since it was at his mercy that the entire kingdom was now mocking Susie's fiancé's refusal to marry her. Avery said it would soon affect the whole family, and not only was he unlucky enough to have a witch sister, 
but these childish pranks were piling up. Andy was dumbfounded by what he heard. The prince couldn't understand anything about Susie's rejection. He didn't understand what it was all about and asked Avery for all the details. At the Imperial Palace, Susie was locked in a dungeon. She sat on the floor and thought about the fact that she had caused trouble for her brother Arnold. The girl thought about how Victoria is there in all colors to report about her. And, probably, just this couple is now crying to the Emperor. Her older brother Morel came to her sister in the dungeon. He came to see her. The girl hugged him tightly. The boy told her that Arnold was fine. He had been sent to the city's guard unit for training, and the most he would get there would be a bit of physical exertion. Merle has comrades in this unit and they will be able to look after him a little bit so everything will be fine. The protagonist was very worried about her brother. Merle told Susie that he couldn't take care of her properly. The girl asked him not to worry because she would be fine and since the emperor had locked her up here, he was not arranging serious proceedings. Susie understood that the death penalty was forbidden. Getting a life sentence was not that terrible. The girl knew she was still a princess his native daughter. Not even six months after her punishment, her father's reputation would be ruined. Based on the fact that Susie was still the chosen one that Emperor Bor's eldest son had personally chosen, and even though the ceremony hadn't taken place, the heir to the throne's intentions remained unchanged. So the girl should be fine. Morel looked at his sister and didn't know what to say, for she was smart beyond her years. The boy tried to understand how such a small girl could be so determined brave and smart at the same time. For some reason, the protagonist was sure that the emperor was definitely not such a cruel person and would not harm her. Juju told the emperor that the seventh princess had made trouble again and that she was causing trouble everywhere she went because earlier she had already fought with the prince and now she was hurting the fourth princess and had ordered a guard to raise his hand against her. The emperor replied that he would let Susie rest for a month and think about her behavior in the palace, and the teacher would teach her a good lesson. The girls were shocked by the ruler's answer. They didn't consider it a punishment. The main character was sitting at the table and reading a book, when suddenly Andy appeared from the window, who said that a commotion had been raised and offered his help in leaving the place. The prince said that if Susie asked him properly, he would take her with him to the kingdom of Bor, and she would be free. The protagonist asked why, if this kingdom was so good, Andy's father was making him stay in the Flower Kingdom. Susie reminded that it's all because in worry for their lives, they ask for the patronage of the Flower Kingdom. The girl said she can't even protect herself, so there's nothing to rant about. Andy realized how sarcastic this girl could be. She said she had to study, said goodbye to the prince and disappeared. The main character, tired, lay over her textbooks and told her teacher that she had read everything. The woman answered her that, in fact, the emperor had ordered Susie not to attend school and just stay in the palace, so it couldn't even be considered a punishment. The protagonist was looking at the entrance of the book storage in the palace with her mouth open. In her past life, the protagonist loved reading very much. Among the books, she felt like she was in paradise. The hall manager said, that there were about a million blueprints and it was the largest book depository on the entire continent. Susie immediately picked up a huge stack of books for herself to read. She ran back and forth through this book vault. The emperor and Hampton watched the girl. The assistant ruler marveled at how obedient and diligent Princess Susie was, for she did not cry or scandalize during her house arrest, but only knew how to run to the book depository and study. 